evening, everyone. Um, it's a little after 6 o'clock. I'm, I'm going to be a little loud, um, and um, I just want everyone to know that the microphones here are not on because they conflict with the microphones that are on the table. So for counselors, if you can speak up the uh, smaller microphones that we have at the table, should be able to uh, pick that up. But I do want to welcome everyone. It's a little after 6. This is the um, workshop of the town council. It is Wednesday, October 18th. Uh, tonight's workshop is on a presentation to the council regarding land development at 289 Payne Road. Um, and the proposed buyer is uh, Patriot Acura of Maine. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the manager for introductions and uh, opening. Sure. Uh, quickly, by way of kind of background, and Jay's going to fill in some of the gaps I, I leave. Uh, staff has met with uh, Mr. Aaron and his, and his colleagues uh, through the course of the summer, on and off. Um, and we've been trying, uh, without success, in finding a date that we could all get together. I've uh, spoken to a number of you just about the ideas that uh, you'll hear this evening just to kind of test this, and I think that's really the way to characterize tonight is to, if the interest is uh, making sure one appreciates what's being proposed, and then uh, at the conclusion, ideally, uh, we leave here with an expectation as to what the next steps uh, are or not for that matter. Um, so with that, I've asked Jay Chase, uh, the planning director, just to give us a little bit of context in terms of how car dealerships have been dealt with in town through the years. I think that might be helpful as we go forward. So, Jay? Yep, just by way of quick context. Uh, so, basically, our zoning ordinance excludes car dealerships as we typically think about them. Um, they're sort of fall under the category of retail sales and service, um, but our definition of retail sales and service talks about allowing uh, automobile sales, car sales, in fully enclosed spaces. So you could do it within a building if you wanted to put all your inventory in a building, but typically we know car dealerships have large <coughs> parking lots and that's basically considered outdoor uh, sales and service. Um, and so by and large, none of our zones are not by and large, our zoning doesn't allow for car dealerships throughout the community. Obviously we have a couple, um, you know, in, in this council I've seen a few recently, Land Rover and Mercedes-Benz <coughs> have come before you uh, for contract zone amendments. <coughs> That's how car dealerships have been established in our community in the last 10, 15 years, whatever the case may be, is through that type of process. Um, and so at this point, the way our zoning is, our zoning ordinance is configured, that's really the only way to move forward. Um, of course, there's other you know, uh, ways to make potential modifications, but in terms of what's happened to date, that's sort of the, uh, the expense of things. And uh, it, just a final point before we turn it over, um, in terms of the preferred approach, of, I've talked to Attorney uh, Shane, and I think contract zoning is the preferred approach, that's fair. So I think for purposes of the conversation, let's consider that to be the approach. And I would just add, from my personal point of view, the two existing dealerships that Jay mentioned, um, you know, the contract zone process allows us and affords the opportunity to have a detailed conversation around a particular project at a particular site. And it gives the council uh, full authority to negotiate the sort of modifications or site development that make it uh, make that use uh, make sense at that location. So I think it, it likely is the preferred uh, uh, approach from the town's perspective as well. So with that, why don't we hear what the idea is? Or Karen sure, Adams. I was just going to, if I could take a minute to uh, introduce uh, Adam Ahrens, who is with Patriot Subaru. And we had the pleasure of meeting with uh, Mr. Ahrens a, a few months back with Tom and Jay and myself. And um, uh, we had a, a great conversation, not just about um, what he was proposing, but really what some of the economic benefits would be and how he um, would uh, approach employment in the area. And I think it, uh, it, it certainly is worth talking about some of his uh, background in terms of uh, being an employer in Maine. Uh, Patriot Subaru has been the number one best place to work in Maine for since 2014. 2014, 15, 16, and 17, he's been named the number one uh, best place to work. He's also the Eco Maine Business of the Year. He's got an Energy Star Award winner, and there's a, several other um, um, awards that really exemplify how he does business um, in the communities that he's working in. So with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, Adam and let him talk about what he's proposing for this area. Um, I'm going to take just a minute and have our, <coughs> our team introduce themselves. 
and um, and then we'll go in and hopefully this workshop becomes truly a workshop, which means two-way communication. Stop us any time. Um, I just want to make sure everybody has the materials that we sent over. We have some additional materials, including some some visions of what we believe it to look like. But um, Rick, if you introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Rick Cheney with Drummond Woodson in Portland, and um, have the pleasure of representing Mr. Aaron's and his company on this project. Hey, I'm Brian Beatty, I'm the general manager of Patriot Super Sofco. My name is Glenn Reed. I'm the uh, fixed ops director for Patriot Super. <coughs> Matthew Phillips from the Hatcher Division of American Hospital. And I don't know that's all of there, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but you can testify. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we are fortunate enough to have um, a, a customer amongst you, um, somebody who's done business with us some, for some time, and, um, and I hopefully more in the future. So I'm going to get the chance to talk about maybe who we are, what we do, and why it's different. Um, we don't do things to be different. We do things to fit the mission of our company. And uh, I will get to the point where you're looking at our, our mission statement. But our mission statement, um, and we have over 100 people that work with us in two different locations now, is two words. It's to serve. So when you see the things that we do, underneath that, it's to serve the customer, it's to serve the community, it's to serve our families, and it's to serve each other. And that drives every decision that we make. Um, I, I first want to say, by sitting here tonight, you guys are a living manifestation of our mission, right? Everybody had a, had a decision whether or not to serve the council. And you may be regretting it at times, and especially when it's 11 o'clock at night, you came for a, a short meeting. But to show up at 6 o'clock on a, on a Wednesday night after having gone through what you guys have gone through as it relates to other issues during the summer and the, the early fall here is um, just we're honored that you'd even consider this. Uh, we are going to ask for kind of a thumbs up, not an approval, but a thumbs up on two different issues in the contract zone. Um, the first one is the ability to construct more than 20,000 square feet, and we're not sure that we're going to be much more than 20,000 square feet. Um, but but um, in this property, we believe it'll be slightly bigger than that. But um, the other one is the outdoor sales that, that Jay brought up. Um, and in your determination that it's outdoor sales, I would love to have it in totally enclosed indoor, uh, indoor everything in Maine. It would certainly affect the amount of snow plowing we do um, and, and the amount of hassle it is to be in the car business here in Maine, but um, at the end of the day, it's not feasible for us financially to do that. Um, part of what we'll discuss tonight is why we were chosen to be the Accurate Dealer, and I will share that with you, and uh, Matt is here to support that. Uh, part of this is to discuss what the neighbors might think of this, and um, in meeting Glenn, who is a um, who's also a lieutenant in the uh, Saco Fire Department, uh, it's, it's called the fire department, um, but he's lived his whole life. Um, four addresses from that? His, his parents lived 247. 247 Payne Road, and uh, he was raised in that house. Um, and, um, and his entire family, as well as over 25 of our associates, are in Scarborough already from Patriot Subaru and Saco. Um, and I think that we were honored to uh, talk a little bit about last week, and then I'll go into the to the rest of who we are. So last week we were indeed named uh, the number one best place to work in Maine four consecutive times. The first time they said a car dealer when they announced this because they do these best places to work competitions around the country and the guys never had, as he said, a car dealer be the best place to work in the state. Now we've done it four years in a row. On top of that, two days later we were named, um, they've had a, a, a program six years now of best car dealerships to work for in the country. We are one of four that have been in the top 100 all six years. We're not a car dealership. We're a family. We're a community. Um, and we, we really have all of the benefits of a big company, but the nimbleness and the decision making of a small company. <clears throat> and not that we don't make mistakes, but we really believe that being a good place to work makes people happy. Happy people do better jobs. People who stay with you do better jobs. And I'll just give you some statistics. In, in Saco, we have about 65 people. You'll go through and see the economics of it. 25 of them uh, on January 1st will have been there for nine years or longer. 15 of them for more than the 14 age numbers of years. And they all get to go on a cruise next year. That's how I know the exact number, because I was booking the cruise for our 15th anniversary. Next week will be our 14th anniversary in Saco. Um, we are not sure why we're the best place to work in Maine, but we're damn glad to be. 
Um, you know, the, the decisions that we make are all driven around our mission statement. Um, and it go, again, going back to the mission statement of to serve, it's the customer, uh, the community, our families, and each other. And some people say, well, no, my family is more important than the customer. I said, okay. As long as you can remember the first two words of this, we're fine. And, and, and I can tell you that the longer you have people doing things in an organization, the more aligned they are with your mission. So it's not just a chance that we have people there for 13 and 14 years um, entering our 14th anniversary. Um, and I'll give you some, some statistics that are different that we're told by the best dealerships. We are 37% female in our SACO location. We are 40% female in our um, Massachusetts location. It's almost impossible because there aren't that many female techs in the world. But um, we believe that that's part of what we are and we believe that we had a vision of mirroring the community. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the other awards that we've received. Um, the first slide that you guys have, do we have it on? Oh, no, we don't have it up. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Okay, you guys have it in front of me. So I will tell you briefly a story about me, and it'll be very brief. Um, I worked for a very large privately held company out of Florida um, in 2003, having traveled the country every week my entire life, going to the airport. Um, I decided that tomorrow was going to be different than yesterday, and yesterday was wonderful. And I decided to do something on my own. Um, I was in a significant position in that company, and everybody was, thought I was crazy. But after 9-11, going to the airport became a different thing. And I couldn't fly to New York in the morning, have three meetings, and then be back home at night and coach Little League. And those were the things that were important to me. And I couldn't do that and be involved in other things. And all of a sudden it became every trip was at least two days or three days or four days or sometimes six or seven days. And I said, okay, so tomorrow's got to be different than yesterday. And um, I left my job and decided to not to work for somebody else but to work with other people and uh, started to pursue some opportunities in the car business and was selected by Subaru to be the dealer in Saco. Uh, my family moved to Maine. Uh, my son in 11th grade was not very happy, so he got a car. Subaru. Yes, he was. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, and he, uh, you know, jumped in. You know, the, the nice thing about coming here from Florida for him, as he says, is he went from being a one-sport athlete to being a three-sport athlete because every kid that wants to play sports in Maine gets to play sports in Maine. Uh, there's just not so many kids at the school, right? So he went from a high school of 5,000 kids to a high school of 1,000 kids. Um, where he actually, or less than a thousand kids, where he knew everybody that he graduated with a year and a half later. Right? So, um, we have been good to Maine. Maine has been better to us. Um, and that's because of the people that I work with. Um, the planning volume, which you see there, is Subaru said we're going to sell 194 cars a year new. Um, last year, Brian, if I'm not mistaken, 1,500, 1500 last year, um, just new, plus our used cars. And this year we will grow another 10 to 12 percent. Right now we're up 14 and a half percent for the year. Every year has been that way. When somebody tells you that trees don't grow to the sky, don't believe them. They can. The opportunity is there if you see the vision. And how we run our company is we determine where we are today, we look at the potential, and we push towards the potential. The nice thing is the more you, the higher you are today, the higher your potential is tomorrow. So Brian gets to calm me down about us trying to continue to run towards the sky. Um, because of that, um, in uh, 2014, we were awarded a brand new point with Subaru in Massachusetts. Um, and it has um, taken off. That's the next page that you'll see. Um, and we've been there for three years. Um, and in 2016, uh, that had a planning volume of 800. And in 2016, um, 1,250 uh, new car sales. And this year, we will hit the, the 1,500 number. We have a formula that says keep your people, they'll get better, keep your people, invest in your people, hire average people, give them good feedback, give them good incentives, and make sure that they're doing things the way that you want them to do and that they fit them. And you have this great success formula, and it's really, really done very well for us. Um, again, the next page is our mission statement, and this will be the third time that I've said it tonight. Um, inside our showroom, we have the, the, the five posters that you see there. But the primary one is our mission, and that is 
that is to serve. That means giving back. That means not only giving money. That means participating in being board members. You know, uh, Rick and I were talking for the first time a couple of days ago, and I said, well, I know you're managing partner because we've sat on two boards together for seven years. Brian has served uh, many boards. All of our associates are given the opportunity to serve on, on boards and be roll up your sleeves physically involved. And we have been recognized for a program called Associate Directed Giving, where the giving is not my choice. The giving is the, Im the input of the associates, the people that work there, tell us what's important to them and their family. If they fit what we like to do, which is people or animals in positions beyond their control. Uh, so that can mean medical, that can mean a horse, that can mean dogs, that can mean children, but that's really kind of the vision. Um, when, when people come up to us and say, we'd like you to be in our program that supports a dance school, that's not us. It's just not us. And um, we've been famously quoted for saying, we don't mix advertising and charity. Advertising is meant to get a return on investment. Charity is to do the right thing. And, and so that's really maybe uh, a big part of the core of what makes us different. And throughout the year, we have 12 charities, and we have three or four major charities at each of our um, stores that receive annual gifts in excess of twenty to twenty to thirty thousand dollars. And Saco last year had three organizations that received in round numbers fifty thousand dollars each. Um, on top of that, we will we will food raise for them. We will dog gift raise for them. And on the day that I was called here, and I hate to tell you guys it was before the summer, um, but you guys had another project to go through. Um, I was called and said, Tom said, can you be at Scarborough Town Hall in 15 minutes? And I said, sure, I was in Scarborough. And if you go to the best places to work in Maine booklet and you, you see the number one, the picture is of us building a Habitat for Humanity house in Scarborough in the rain. It was a little colder than I like. But, um, and I was dressed in one of these things doing that thing. Um, and not only did we build it, we funded it. We wrote a check for $45,000, which if you know the Habitat story, if you don't and you don't want to know, don't worry about it, but if you know the Habitat story, that could build the next 20 houses for them if they do it the right way. Um, so it can kind of live in, in perpetuity. So Habitat doesn't give houses away. I think that's uh, one of the things that I didn't know until I engaged them. But um, over the years, we've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for um, Preble Street and the food bank. Um, we've partnered with Strive, an organization that we're very proud of. And not only do we use our facilities to sell cars and service cars, we use those facilities for them to raise money, for them to have meetings, for them to use, you know, we're not using the, a car dealership 24-7. So there's some opportunities. And um, if you're familiar with Strive and Kevin on the roof, Kevin's been at our place at records, is this three years in a row? Two years. Two years. Two years. Um, and this year, 30, $38,000 over Labor Day weekend raised, and a lot of that's our associates getting it. Um, I can tell you this, we believe we're the only um, car dealership in America to have an organic vegetable garden on its premises. You can say I'm really altruistic about that, but we have to have a place to put snow too, right? So you can't just build everything. So in Maine, we decided to double use everything. And then the last thing I'll talk about our, our location here and our mission. So this is my name tag from Subaru. And there's a thing called the Love Promise. What we've done, Subaru has adapted and taken to all of its dealers throughout the country. They have a Love Promise Award every month. They've done it for 35 months. We've won it six of those 35. There's only 614 Subaru dealers. We do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. The second thing is this silver thing. And we do have an advantage. It's an eco-friendly Subaru dealership. Um, we, have, uh, we were the first ones to be eco-friendly. Both of our dealerships are eco-friendly, and if you have questions about us being eco-friendly in Scarborough, I own the company. We own a company called Green Dealer Support that goes out and tells people how to behave properly. It's more about behaviors than it is about your facility. Your behaviors dictate what your facility needs are. And one of the things that we love about this property is that we'll, we, and I can guarantee it in writing, we will have zero negative impact on the environment. Um, and if you come down to our dealership in, in Saco, and I'm assuming that everybody has driven by there, you may not have noticed many things. The thing that I tell people to notice in your position, and if you're in planning and zoning, 
is when we built that in 2003, I decided I was never going to fight with you guys. So they came to us and said, we need a 50-foot setback. I said, okay. And we have a beautiful 50-foot setback, and you guys only require 25. And I say, okay, so don't go to 50. Uh, but, but, and, and I say, okay. But you go down, and every other dealer that's had construction since has fought that. Every single dealer in Saco has fought that. I'm not here to fight with you. Um, we, we have used LED lighting since the day you could put LED lighting in it, and we took the old lights and donated them to the school system because they could use them in one or two or three of their parking lots. Um, every decision that we make has a financial piece of it. Don't get me wrong. But they also have a people piece of it. And sometimes we have to be smart enough to make bad financial decisions because they're good people decisions. It doesn't mean we do that all the time. Uh, but every one of them has a, has a piece of that. And by the way, we do things that the lawyers tell us to never do. We throw Christmas parties. We throw holiday parties. Um, we, we let people have a good time. We take people on cruises. Um, we do things that, that you would do with your family because we virtually are a family. And, um, and we've supported each other through wonderful events and through tragedies. Um, and, and that's how you build this, this kind of team. So, um, going to the next page. We can skip that. We did best places to work. Um, this talks about how we provide um, and you will see um, when we get to our pay plan. So we, we reward people for their tenure. Um, we pay 100% of everybody's medical, dental, and vision, including mental health. We do not pay the family share. We do not. So that's how we. This is how I was treated when I worked for a big company, made a lot of money. This is how, I, and we've never. This is not a negotiable, right? So this year, when our medical premiums went through the roof. Um, we didn't stop supporting 100% of our associates um, with, with, their, with their medical and dental and vision, and it has gone up. Profit sharing. So we take a chunk of what we make at the end of the year and we give it back to the associates. Um, and we have associates who have hundreds of thousands of dollars in their profit sharing accounts today. Um, we have a 401k match. They get a, uh, well, an annual holiday bonus based on uh, performance and tenure. So some people do have incentive in and, and so what you do is you want people to stay there the whole year, you have to put a carrot out there for the end of the year, both based on the group and based on their individual performance. Um, everybody gets paid vacation. And then I think maybe the biggest and most important part of this is, is that we continue to provide education. Um, I have an office in every one of my buildings, and we also have a training room. But every day my office is used for training. My background becomes what do I think I can do to have impact in this world? And that is to make you better achieve the things that you want to for your family. So the way that we do that is through continually, ed, continual education. And our budget in Saco and uh, North Attleboro together are about $220,000 for education, continual education, including some travel that, uh, that we support on, a, on an annual basis. So here's the economic piece of this that I think you should be highly aware of. So in Saco, um, we have 70 currently 70 full-time, when we did this we had 65, and 17 part-time people with an average compensation of about $50,000 plus benefits. Um, the car business is not the most highly educated. We're not really looking at MIT um, and Harvard to get our associates. So we're looking for people in Maine, all of which, all of our associates live in Maine. Um, and it is very much a bell curve. If you have questions about this, we are about 10% over $100,000, and in our part-time jobs, we're in that $20,000 range. So our, our midpoint is about $50,000, um, and that does not include their bonuses at the end of the year or any of the other benefits. North Attleboro opened up uh, three years ago, and our compensation, because tenure is a big part of our compensation, is slightly lower. Um, but I will tell you this, given the chance or the choice of employing people in Maine or Massachusetts, you want to live in Maine. Um, the people in Maine are special, and, and that's one of the reasons we chose that Scarborough would be the right place for us. So um, Scarborough has been good to us. We've been good to Scarborough, and we think that this facility, and I'll show you some pictures of the, uh, the facility that we've designed or have in design, um, and, and get some feedback from you guys about it. But we think we can be a gem at your exit, which I think is part of the issue on Hygis Parkway is, okay, when people drive off that exit, what am I going to see? Right. And we hope they're going to see this. 
There's a second piece and element of that is that this is a 17 acre purchase, somewhere between 16 and 17. I can't figure that out yet. I've been told both. We, I, for the car dealership, do not plan on using all of it. I plan on getting input from the city, from the council, from planning and zoning, and there will be a financial element. If we can make something make sense on the other half-ish of this, I'd be happy to be the landlord for that or the occupant, tenant and occupant for that. So I don't know what's going to happen. If somebody says, well, how much of it are you going to use? I think we're going to use about half of it, um, not affecting the wetlands and being very sensitive to that, using the setbacks and doing all those things, providing some environmental things that other people wouldn't do because of the upfront cost. Um, you know, whether that's radiant heating and, and geothermal um, or solar, we'll do whatever analysis works best for that piece of property, but to have as minimal impact. Um, I happen to have built the dealership in Saco in 2003, and it is environmentally sound. It's won many awards for it, but it doesn't have solar and it doesn't have geothermal. Um, I built a home uh, a few years ago. It's 100% <laughs> off the grid but on the grid because we're not allowed to store our energy. But we use solar for 100% of the house and I get to pay 20% to exchange between me and the, the power company so they get, they get the money. But um, we're, we're going to find something that, that really works here and we have had zero, zero, zero incidences around the environment, around cities, around zoning, about anything from either of the locations that we're operating in. And I think you, you need to know that, that, that my decisions as a, as a business owner, the first and most important one in every decision is how much headache is this going to be? If I say yes, is this going to hit me in the back of the head? And, and the reality is if I can make a decision once at some point or a few months down the road and this becomes really nothing but good, then we made the right decision for ourselves and the community. So um, that's the environmental piece. Um, Kate and I had a little chance to, to talk about some of the charities that we support here. Um, it just This list is nowhere near comprehensive. Um, we have, um, in the last five years in SACO, paid for a portion of the adoption of 145 dogs. In North Alabama, we will hit 100 on Saturday. Um, we do it three times a year in each of our facilities. We underwrite a portion of the adoption. We work only with um, with rescue um, groups and we actually have a preference to work with rescue groups that are virtual rescue groups. Um, people that are not in, um, raising money to support an infrastructure but finding a way for this to be more effective. We have um, a significant number of people who we've supported the adoption of children um, inside our organization um, and, and we continue to support our school systems um, with scholarships at certain high schools for kids that need it. It is, again, the core of who we are. And we have associates who, their kids, um, because they choose to go to school at expensive schools, and I think every school in Maine is expensive as it relates to college, so if you're, if you're not there with your kids yet, you will be. Um, and we support and underwrite a portion of their education, too. And I don't give out $20,000 scholarships. We give out small scholarships that help kids get through um, and don't have financial impact on their parents by us writing the check directly to the college, which is kind of a good thing. Adam, if I might, just in the interest of time, yes. I want to make sure we, uh, you've built a very strong case for okay. the company. Uh, I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that we hear more about the particular proposal and there may be some time for questions of council. Excellent. So, uh, and, I, and again, I don't know, uh, Bill, if you can see this, but this is not our facility. This is. Uh, an accurate uh, design and Im implemented facility in Massachusetts and a view of it at night. Um, we intend to do this in scale, uh, but from the from your eyes it would look very much like this with proper setbacks. Um, and this is uh, this is a building completed this year. Um, the top one completed this year, yeah. the bottom one in 2009. Okay. Look. Yeah, so and this is a daytime look of it. Um, and, and so I certainly have, we have people here who can answer questions about what it would look like, what, it, what our scope and size is. When we opened SACO, I think you should know that we, uh, we were in about 21,000 square feet. We're now at about 31,000 square feet. We've expanded it. Um, and our other facility is 27,000 square feet. So we're going to be in that 20 to 27. If you guys came back to me and said you have to do this at 20,000 square feet, I would be back to you a few years down the road based on the success pattern that we've had, the need to expand it. And I prefer to do it all at the same time. So 
Uh, and this is a much bigger indoor than we will have at our facility here. So uh, the last piece which you guys have in your booklets is a, a piece of the, the, the property there. So if you have any questions about that property, that property is at the northeast corner of Payne and, and Hyannis Parkway. Uh, it has been owner occupied for probably before I was born. Um, and uh, it, uh, as I've been told, this is in, in somewhat hearsay, but there, there was a large assessment for the sewer um, system that was put in that will be settled at the time um, we transfer ownership. Uh, we will be using Sebago Technics to be our engineers. We will use all main construction. We're not going to go out of state as we've seeked our, our, our bids for architects mm -hmm. or anything. We believe that we do business with the people in the state. We expect the people in the state to do business with us. The closest accurate dealership, which I was asked this question today, is not in Maine. There has never been an accurate dealership in Maine. This will be the first one and the only one, we hope. Uh, and so somebody says, why do you want to be over there? I said, for access for the people from the north, access for people from Portland, as the only accurate dealership in Maine, it's the ideal location for us. And maybe I shouldn't talk about this, but we did look at some other pieces of property that were impossible to buy that we would not be here. You would have approved it through, uh, through planning and zoning. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have much to go with the town council because we wouldn't need any variance. This is the right place for us to be. We're the right place to, we're the right organization to be on that property. And Acura believes that as well. Acura's process was, uh, how many dealers did you talk to? Nine. nine dealers had an actual formal interview here in Maine. And uh, on informing the other nine, the other eight dealers that, that we were the right choice, many of them said, you're right. They are the right choice. I have never bought an existing business. We've built every business from scratch. Um, it is part of who we are. It causes some brain damage along the way, like these meetings. Um, but you guys know about brain damage in these meetings. So um, I can cut it at this point and certainly open to questions from anybody um, and happy to take them. Yeah, I have a question about the site. In the, on the last page, um, you kind of have a shaded area where the 6.36 acres are. Well, what is the actual, the lot? The lot encompasses the whole corner over to the... The lot is this, 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 what's in the red here. Got it. So it includes the the home, the private home that's there currently? Yes, yes. Yeah. It is an occupant cell. And, and the intention is, is really just to build it in that six, in the yellow shaded area. So the, inten now, uh, so the intention that I have is you, if you could visually um, draw a, a line through the, about the middle, um, we believe that we would like to build an entrance, and this is not finalized, but an entrance that is big enough to access both sides, so for, for whatever ends up on this side, and an entrance uh, both from Hand Road and an entrance from uh, Pikes Park. So you would have uh, in and out. As far as traffic, if you do have questions about that, I'm certainly, uh, uh, we do traffic counts at our dealership in, in Massachusetts, which is more of the size of this one. It's less than 100. Um, in and out today, including the associates who are in the room. I, I just want to be clear, yeah. the second to last page in the packet there, there's a, there's a plan that looks something like this. There's actually two different parcels shown. I believe what's being proposed is the is the top parcel. Yes, it's not the little yellow one. The little yellow one is an adjacent property. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. I I think, think, yeah. Clear. So, so okay. and, and, and to be clear, we were told, and this is not your fault, we were told on Wednesday that we had to have something over by Friday, and we had days to save on Friday, <laughs> and we had some other things going on. Uh, the best places to work was Wednesday, and best places to do work uh, deal with was Thursday. So this was kind of get you guys to, uh, a as much as we could quickly. So. Yeah. If if you look at the, I don't think you have it in your materials, but the uh, on the tax map. It's tax, tax map R052, <laughs> it's lot 5, and it's quite clear on that. It's, it's the corner piece. It's not quite rectangular because it has a little bit of a jaw. This is like right called curl. Right it is a curl. Okay. It is a curl. And when we look at this one, it's just this, just this lot right here. It's not, doesn't include this. Yes. Just this one. Okay. Yes. The oddly shaped corner. <laughs> So most of the land no, that fronts on Hygis Parkway is going to remain undeveloped 
for some other use. And the focus of orientation is more towards the property <coughs> points towards uh, Payne Road. Correct, towards the exit. Yes, and uh, we absolutely believe we'll be visible when you come off that exit. Um, we, you're going to be staring at us, and that's where the premium comes from for the price. The mm -hmm. main entranceway is proposed to be off of Payne Road. Both. Mm -hmm. Both. Main entrance. Would you characterize them both as main entrances? I would. I would. So, so I, I would think that it's going to be easier for some people to access us from from the east, and uh, it's through one. Um, yeah, I think it would be both, and I think the larger entrance itself will actually be on Tigers Parkway, the larger one, because we're going to need to be prepared for what happens down the road to the to the other part of that park. Um, I can have a two lane in and out on Payne Road. I would want a four lane with a divider on on Highland Parkway, which we have a four lane with divider at um, at in Saco right now, and I have a two lane without divider in North Attleboro and a second entrance that is a two lane without divider. Other questions, Mr. Don? Yeah, I think one of the big questions we have is uh, is this going to be a sprawling uh, uh, car parking lot area along Haigas Parkway, uh, or are are there ways in which you would intend to uh, landscape so as to minimize the kind of sprawling parking space aspect of this and uh, allow people to sort of focus more on the building, which looks like an attractive building. I, I think you're, you hit the nail on the head, right? So we want to be part of this community and part of the, the Maine community, and I think Maine has seen its share of car rows that happens to exist in Saco. I don't want to bring accurate Saco. I don't know if you know about the product, but um, the product is a premium product uh, manufactured by, um, by Honda, and, and we think it has to, it, it's the feel and the environment of the place. We are buying a lot more land than I need for a dealership. So, yeah, while it'll be zero scaped, it'll be very heavily landscaped, and it will not look like. And there's, you won't see balloons. You won't see lines and lines and lines of cars. But uh, I'm I am looking to have about 250 parking spots on that facility. And somebody says 250 parking spots, where you need display, you need customer parking, you need service parking, but you also need associate parking. Um, uh, public transportation in Southern Maine means you better drive a car to get to work. And and so it takes if you have 30 people at work, that's 30 parking spots. If you have 30 service tickets that day, it's actually 60 parking spots. Um, and then your display of vehicles. Thank you, Abu. So um, it, it, clearly, you're the right company. There's no question about the the, the pedigree of the company and the, the community benefits. That's not even an issue. Um, my concern is that's really kind of a gateway into Scarborough, and it's the first impression people are going to get coming in. So I, my question would be, how stringent is Acura in terms of your signage and display? Are you going to need to have Acura out front bold everywhere to be able to see from the highway and that kind of stuff, or are you going to be willing to kind of work with us to blend it in a little bit so it's not kind of... We're fine blending it in. I think they're going to require that we have um, a pylon sign. The nose are big. Mm -hmm. um, as well as a sign, uh, the uh, indicator in the middle of the building. Uh, I don't know if they call it an icon tower, but that's what I call it, an icon tower. <laughs> um, so those are those are design requirements. Mm -hmm. um, we're sensitive to the amount of signage, and you know I, I don't want to be uh, held to this. But if you guys decided that on that corner that the cutout is, that you wanted a welcome to Scarborough sign and lights, and you were going to pay for it. I'm fine. That's in your that's that's your right there, um, and I would blend around it. I don't want to go out there and build a. Um, I, I'm not going to go build an A-frame building because the city of Scarborough has required me to build an A-frame building to put Acura in that location. That's not going to happen. They're going to need some of these elements, um, and we thought this piece of land was worth it enough to fight to make sure that we reach the place where we can move forward and provide those jobs here in town. But. So I, I'd, I'd like to know what elements are non-negotiable. Um, street pylon sign, mm -hmm. uh, which is not pictured there. Right. Mm -hmm. The icon tower in the front of the building is a, considered a 
essential uh, element. There's mm -hmm. uh, the signage similar to what you'd see on the front there. Um, you have a pylon, a street pylon sign that varies in size. There are different heights for different requirements. And those are your only, now, I, I assume the, the building fascia and appearance has to be very similar to that yeah, kind of I mean corporate that's, branding? That's been very consistent throughout the years. It's actually the Generation 3, and if you go back to Gen 1 or Gen 2 from the exterior, you see a very similar look. Mm -hmm. The interior is really where it's changed, and some of the elements of the icon tower has always been consistent. But the only thing not pictured there would be that street pylon sign. And again, it was very... And it looks like that, it's just like that, but... The height will be whatever the zoning allows it to be, um, and the total signage will be whatever the zoning allows it uh, to be. But just to be clear, through the contract zone process, kind of all bets are off. There's there's no requirements, there, or we can have those conversations uh, as to what our preference and what your need is. Right? I want people to know that they're in Scarborough, and I want them looking at a beautiful building that's well landscaped that employs people. I think you do too, and I think that's where <laughs> that's where the, the mind should be, and produces revenue for the city that. Wouldn't the sign ordinance take, take yeah, a back I, I guess I overstated that, but yeah. there's no, uh, do, there's not necessarily default uh, design standards. There's a number of them that would apply, but there's uh, great flexibility afforded through this process. And, and the design features would go through very similar. I mean, we just recently changed the design for the Jaguar, which has almost the same mm -hmm. type of design mm -hmm. in the front, quite not as many windows. Mm -hmm. And I was here when the prime dealership first came in, and that used to be a big old pink barn. Yep. And so uh, we went through all of that as part of the contract zone when it initially because that's considered, you know, that particular entrance into Scarborough was kind of considered the entrance to Scarborough. So we were very concerned, and I'm sure we'll do the same due diligence. Do recall, one of the uh, key ingredients of a contract zone process that involves uh, from the front at the front end of the process, the involvement of the planning board. So they are your arguably your folks that will have a lot of input and it would be great um, the requirement will be for the applicant to work with the planning board and come back with some very tangible legitimate plans so you can see and react to it I like this I don't like that can you talk a little bit you know it, so it sounds like your 17 acres and you're going to use about half of it but yeah. you say you're really open to maybe some other uses for the land that's unused you know, we're kind of in the middle of a planning process where we have an older comprehensive plan and a new one. But the people that participate have talked a lot about walkability and improving access to some of our resources. They, so can you talk a little bit more about what sorts of uses you'd be open to consider? So in, in my mind, it was something that provided some employment. It is still at, at, a, at a, uh, kind of the economic end of Agus Parkway as opposed to, and, and and it might be some visibility, so it could be office space, it could be office space and child care together, it can be bank, if, banks are great tenants, so um, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a landlord I like bank, um, but but I also <coughs> am sensitive to what access this has, so that I know there's a lot going on behind here, mm -hmm. and what that ends up being, for instance in, in Saco and in, in um, North Attleboro, we have but preserves. We've preserved part of our property, but we also have butt preserved, and, and we've had people, um, unfortunately, in Saco, you know, use that to access um, snowmobile. Mm. Which we don't think, you know, snowmobiles and cars do so well together in the same spot, but, but, I mean, there's hiking trails and there's the eastern trail that goes right behind there, so we've been very sensitive to that, but I don't know, but I will tell you, there will be a financial element of it, right? So you're not, you can't come to me and say, we'd like you to build a daycare that's going to lose a million dollars a year, because we want to take care on that facility. That's not going to work for me. But putting in something, eight acres in a prime location, should be something that together we can capitalize on um, while making the community better. Council? So. And I pres presume that would be part of the contract. We'd, we'd be specifying something, or the contract zone would apply to the entire parcel? It wouldn't necessarily. Uh, I think it would apply to the land that would be necessary for the car dealership. Uh, it could include the entire parcel, but uh, until you know what the use is, it may be permitted already under the zone. So uh, those are particulars that we haven't really talked through. But I can roll out some things, one of them being a restaurant. <laughs> I have a restaurant on my property in, in North Alboro. Uh, we can roll out a restaurant. Uh, <laughs> uh, but eight acres, I don't know what eight acres means. It, you know, I mean, is it is it sufficient enough for somebody to build a hotel if that's what was 
the desire? Is it sufficient enough for somebody to, I think the answer to that is yes. Is it sufficient enough to build a five or four, or I don't know what your limitations are, a nine, five, four, six story office building that could house, you know, 120 people? I think it is. And have parking. Um, but again, that that's a decision that I'm not ready to give you any answers to, other than it will be good to the city. Councilor? Councilor? Oh, sorry, Kate. Thank you. Um, one, I mean, you couldn't have a better attorney that um, is concerned about the land. So I think that's, a, in my eyes, it's a, it's a huge benefit for you because I know he's going to make sure that that land is well taken care of. So for me, that's a comfort. Um, second, I think you've really shown that we would be, um, it would be a large miss for us to not want to partner with you. Um, I'm not a fan of Sacco's, um, well, I don't know what they call it anymore, Automile. Auto Auto yeah. um, it drives me crazy. Uh, it's something that I never, ever, ever would wanted to see in Scarborough, and I think we're lucky that we've been able to, um, while we do have a few dealerships, we've been able to space them out, and I think that's what this would also do. Um, I also think that you would be uh, a great person and a, obviously an incredible company to work with, and you touch on a lot of the things that are important to me outside of just being a company. Um, there is more to being just a company. Uh, so I, for me, I think this is, a, this is a great starting process. I think, you know, obviously we're going to need more information moving forward, um, but I'm, I don't have any specific questions at this point um, or any direct concerns right now um, that I need addressed tonight except just to say that um, I'm really impressed with your presentation you. and I hope that moving forward we get to work with your company. Thank you. Other comments? Yeah, so last question. I mean, it's my biggest hang-up is the gateway coming in. That's that's the first thing people are going to see coming up. I guess we're really focusing on trying to make the character of the town there. Um, if this doesn't work out at this location, are you looking at other options in Scarborough, or is it off the table? Completely? We've looked at other options in Scarborough, and it takes a willing seller. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had willing seller outside of contract zone, mm -hmm. or a non-willing seller outside of contract zone, and willing seller with issues that they said they, they ran it by the council. Um, we pursued some significant pieces of land, and the sellers just aren't willing to, to move. Um, to do those things, and um, we have looked outside of Scarborough. We think Scarborough is the right place, and they, <coughs> you know, Glenn's been here his whole life. He's going to run the dealership. That's that's a really good thing, and my family will will be in this market as well. Um, we just we think this is the right place. Now, I do want to address those concerns. Right? Somehow, good, bad, or indifferent. If you look at the four corners that are there, that are all in, um, we would be the nicest corner that you have. Um, that's not that they're bad. We would be the gem of that corner and lead to a place where people would like to live and work. And I, I, I don't, it's an accurate store. You don't have to worry about selling 500 cars a month. Matt would love us to, but it's not going to happen, right? It's not a high traffic. Um, we've never done outdoor out, uh, outdoor loudspeaker advertising. We've, we were modern before modern became modern, the right thing to do. Um, so. It, you won't see anything but what you see here. You may see four or six people in this picture when we're open, but that's about it. Um, you will see high-speed doors if you guys say, you know, we'll approve this, but the doors can't face Payne Road. Okay. I work with an architect to figure that out. Okay. And we can we can do certain things, but I think it will be what you're looking for. I don't know what everybody's vision is. I do know that you guys have struggled with this for a long time and having sat in on no seats before in another town, it's difficult. Because behind me now you have a huge piece of land that will in many ways dictate what happens to the future of this town. I don't think this will dictate negative anything, but I think it'll be a good part of the, gate, of the gateway there. And like I said, you have an easement here that I don't believe will be used for traffic that we can figure out what you guys want to do with it, too. Uh, could you expand on that? What is the easement? There's this corner here that you guys have control of. And I don't know if it's cut out for traffic. I know it's city controlled, and it's not individual landowners. 
And I'm not sure what the design of that was, whether it was, you know, a welcome to Scarborough sign. Um, it's part of the, the, the public way. Part of the right of way. Is it yeah, part of the right of way? It's a similar uh, reservation on the officer's porch. So I think it's part of the design of the intersection. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was for, for traffic or signage or, uh, I, I, and I don't know what the, the long-term vision is 30, 40 years down the road for the amount of traffic on Highlands Parkway um, or Payne Road, but I, I assume at some point Payne Road might be a little bit wider than it is down as it gets closer to whoever goes into the Scarborough Downs. Mm -hmm. I'll get there yet. So yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 tried, I tried to make it through an hour, but I didn't about that right now. <laughs> Um, so I have two questions. Um, I'm not sure if it's um, we'll add more questions, but um, one is what's the timeline for uh, from start to finish? Um, from approval to completion, in about eight months. Eight months. Uh, we we don't believe it's going to be a lot of cycles. Um, it's fairly flat piece of land. I don't think I'm going to pull a lot of boulders out of there. And, uh, and what's the expectation for the process? When do you think that the, I'm talking to Jay? When would the council receive um, its preliminary information to get started on this? Or, I mean, what is the process so the citizens understand what, what are we going to do next? Sure, I can speak the process and when they would ultimately come forward, I guess I'd turn it back. But generally the process would be, and I think Tom already alluded to this, the first meeting is a joint meeting of the council and the planning board um, in which both members, uh, planning board and council, sort of provide feedback. And ultimately at that first meeting, joint hearing, um, the council sort of gives a, a more formal thumbs up than they might tonight, but I think they're looking for some sort of a, a gauging of the temperature tonight, as we've already heard. From that, um, the uh, applicant comes before the board, first to the council, I should say, for a first reading. And that first reading is really um, a discussion, thank you, <laughs> um, it, um, with the uh, with the council again sort of getting that task approval then it goes to planning board for a preliminary site plan review in which the planning board does you know 80 percent review process if you will of a site plan maybe they haven't nailed down every bit of the uh, stormwater controls but the architecture is going to be pretty well locked in mm -hmm. we'll know every sort of component of the zoning that needs uh, articulation in the contract zone and that's what comes back to the council ultimately for an approval um, process um, so there'll be that preliminary approval by the planning board they'll have sort of articulated any you know concerns they have or things that need to be addressed council will sort of review that and uh, provided the council adopts the the contract zoning that becomes the zoning for the land then the plan goes back to planning board for final site plan review. Uh, planning board can't uh, make an uh, adoption of the site plan approval process until the zoning's changed. So um, that's sort of the the process. So there's 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 a series of meetings, uh, and when that sort of process would start, I guess is I would turn it back to Adam and his team. So from the start, um, so outside development, just mm -hmm. the planning process until we get an approval. Generally, is that going to take a year, is it six months? Oh, no, I would say maybe a, a two to three months okay. on the outside of things. If there's a DEP permitting that's required, that, that could take up, upwards to, that might bump it out to six months. But I would say that, to me, I would think that would be on the, on, the long, um, on the long end of the spectrum. But no longer than that, but two to three months seems like what I would anticipate to be the sweet spot to be for our part. Adam would like to be in the ground. I'd like to be open this time next year. But starting construction in? Uh, as cold a month as we can, or as, uh, it, it, it's looking like the winter. We're fine with, with doing construction like this in the winter. Maybe six months from yeah. give or take at the most. Um, so yeah, you were you at the beginning? You started this by you know wanting to take a bit of a temperature read, and um, I, I haven't heard anything tonight that concerns me overly, except I do agree with Councillor Chiazzo about that corner, so I want to see more of those details flushed out. Um, uh, and congratulations on your number one best place to work you for four years in a row, now beat out the company that I used to work for. So they're a little bit, uh, oh, we to, we they're chasing to, we your we tail. We went to today, <laughs> and they were on the list, and, we, and my, I, I saw my physician in the same building, they were on the list, and they were like, how do you do it? <laughs> 
all you got to do is show up, you'll figure it out. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. So I think it was somebody else earlier said, you know, it, I recognize you uh, in terms of vision and mis mission and your commitment to the community, I think you're the right partner. Um, but I definitely want to see more details before I can say absolutely uh, feel good about it. But thank you for the level of uh, detail that you provided tonight. So, uh, just discussing it amongst ourselves, uh, <coughs> maybe the quality of the ownership uh, and the community commitment is uh, can't be matched. So, I mean, you'd like to accommodate a business that brings that to our community. Uh, it's all about the appearance uh, uh, there, and one, this is a high-end uh, automobile, the pictures look good, the willingness to uh, landscape to minimize the kind of fields of cars I think was is encouraging to me, so uh, while I agree with the statements that were made, uh, there's a ways to go, uh, I certainly would look favorably on this based on what we've heard. Yeah, so just from a comment section, we're wrapping it up. Um, I, I can support moving it forward, but I will pay very particular attention to form. That is going to be very crucial moving through this uh, and completing the process. So um, I, I, I compliment you on your presentation. you got a good team. you got the right approach. Um, but we really need to look at the, the image of Scarborough and keep that in mind, too, as we work forward. So congratulations on, on, on the dealership, and uh, I hope we do get to work together, but that's going to be my, my focus for sure. Yeah, just, just kind of a piggyback on everything that's been said, and actually a little bit of a disclaimer. I am, the, I've been a long-term customer of Patriot Subaru. They do walk the talk, everything you've heard tonight. They do model, and that's been my experience. So I'll echo the, the comments about it. It's a really great organization for our community, so I applaud that. Similarly to some of the other questions, the, the devil's always in the details. So as we go through the process, I'll be really interested in some of the things we've already discussed. But welcome and thank you for the interest and look forward to further conversations. Thank you. We will, uh, we will proceed um, and we will um, begin engaging some things so that you can see some things um, <coughs> at, at our next meeting. And, and, and again, as much as I, I don't want to burden you with this because you guys have taken on a lot, we also are sensitive to what you want, so there may be a time when we just kind of email you and say, you know, this is, give us some feedback. This is what my vision is. And I, I still don't have a vision of what you want to see on that corner. And not saying that it doesn't include us, but I don't know what anybody's vision is and what the town's vision is that corner is at this point. Staff is certainly available to provide some um, comments and, and input uh, if that's of value. Rick certainly is aware of the process. Really, right. to initiate this, you need to make a formal application with the town clerk. And that, in turn, would uh, require us to schedule the meetings and the process as Jay laid out. And I just want to mention, um, as a council, we have received um, many requests to listen to development projects, particularly in contract zones. And this is probably one of the <coughs> presentations. You came extremely prepared with a great story as well as great information. So um, good luck. I, I'm very much in support of this. I think it's the right, uh, right approach for that particular area. Well, thank you again, and thank you for doing what you guys do. Thank you. We'll get out of your way. Thank you. Yeah, and for council, um, if we can give a couple minutes um, for any to reserve to me, but if we can come back immediately and we'll start the <coughs>
Good evening, everyone. It's a little bit after five past um, seven. Sorry for the delay. We just completed a workshop of the Scarborough Town Council. This is now the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council for Wednesday, October 18th. And um, we will begin uh, with a call to order. And if you'd rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Councilor Donovan. Present. Councilor Rowan. Here. Councilor Foley. Here. Councilor St. Clair. Oh, here. Councilor Hayes. Here. Councilor Chiazzo. Here. Chairman Bayby. Here. And moving into item number four, this is an opportunity for general public comments. Okay. If you'd like to get up and speak, if you could please state your name and address, um, and this is a time to speak about something that is not on the agenda. <laughs> My name is Mike Doyle. I live in Falmouth. I own FalmouthToday.me. I've done a number of articles about the town of Scarborough. And in my freedom of access request, I've come across a number of interesting emails between Kathy Chandler and Chief Moen. And Kathy works as an administrative assistant. And I'm going to read some of the emails tonight. Uh, some of us will know the background of these emails and understand what they mean. This is Kathy Chandler writing to uh, Chief Moan. By the way, her husband made her unfriend her boss on Facebook, according to my sources. <coughs> Will do. Voice is getting worse. It was suggested I take advantage of it and set up a 900 line and make a little money while I have such a sexy voice. Ha! Huh. Enjoy your time off. Week looks good. Robbie sends this email to her. Thanks. You're the best. Kathy says, only for you. Okay. Robbie sends to Kathy, I was watching for your reaction. Nothing. Dot, dot, dot. Kathy says, I knew better. <coughs> Kathy writes to Robbie, hey, my mouth seems to move quicker. <coughs> Does that count? to her, damn, spelled with about 10 N's. Not to worry, you'll see them soon enough. It's overcast and windy here. It's a good day. Stay in bed for sure. She's writing about her boots, quote unquote. Yeah, it'd probably be better on a nice sunny day when everything is blooming. <laughs> Kathy writes back, LOL, indeed. My understanding is Kathy was a $14,000 a year dispatcher before Chief Mullen recruited her to be his administrative assistant, and she makes someplace in the area of $70,000 now. Here's one from uh, Kathy to uh, Robbie. No kidding. No schedule. She writes, well, unreal. Well, at least you've got me to entertain you while you wait. Perhaps I shall be in the need to have a BlackBerry, quote unquote, or a laptop to take with me next week when I have to go in. That way I can be entertained while I wait to tell them they're all guilty. I think she was being called for a jury duty. Mr. Doyle, time is up. Sounds good. Gives me plenty of time to read some more next week. Thank you. Super. If the next person would like to get up and speak. Good evening. My name is Pauline Levin, and my address is 5 Lane by the Sea in Scarborough. And what I'm presenting or talking about tonight represents my own views. They're not those of any other person or group. I am concerned that the vote to start the discontinuance process is on tonight's agenda. It seems premature to vote on this since all affected parties 
have not formally agreed to the conditions written by Mr. Bannon. In fact, as I understand it, the various owners of the condo association have not had the opportunity to study, study the matter and will not until the regular meeting near the end of November. I actually feel that by starting the process tonight, the town is signaling its bias and thus exerting some pressure on those owners to make a quick approval. This seems especially true since all documents have been written and are merely waiting for their signatures. Now, I am also glad to see that the town has hired an interim assessor. This is very timely since until now the town has been unable to say how the increased property from Avenue 2 will affect each owner's taxes. Since this is an unusual situation that involves the town, I assume one of his first assignments will be to appraise the value of the 25 feet additional feet to be granted to each abutter and therefore an assumed increase in property tax going forward. This information should really be available to all in order to make a thoughtful decision. Thank you for your time. Hello, I'm Kelly Murphy. I live at Five Woodfield Drive, and I'm just here tonight to officially invite you and all of Scarborough to our second annual Scarborough Community Thanksgiving celebration. It's actually on Thanksgiving Day between 11 and 1 o'clock at Wentworth School Cafeteria. And last year was our first event, and we had 250 people come and eat. Um, and it was really, truly a community event. We had um, the meals entirely covered by donations from individuals and companies in Scarborough. Um, the Scarborough Garden Club does the centerpieces. We had um, ice cream as part of our dessert, donated by Beals and Suzanne Foley Ferguson. Um, we had volunteers from um, last year very young to very old. Um, if you need a ride, the community services bus <coughs> will come and pick you up if you live in Scarborough. We really hope um, to have as many people this year, maybe even a little more. Um, and it's for anybody, not just those who can't afford it, anyone who just wants to spend time with anyone else on Thanksgiving or doesn't want to cook themselves, because it's a pain in the neck and this is now my out, I can always go here. Um, and it really was very nice last year and it really does resemble a restaurant. We have cloth, tablecloths and napkins, we eat on china, it's, it was very nice and the food is prepared by um, our nutrition department staff for the schools and the community services was highly involved and Audra Keenan's in, involved in the planning. Um, and we just really hope to um, see a lot of community members there on Thanksgiving Day between 11 and 1 at Wentworth School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on any item that's not on tonight's agenda? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment and moving on to item number five is the approval of of minutes from October 4th, 2017, and what is the will of the council? So moved. Is there any edits or modifications or changes for the clerk? Not seeing any, all in favor? All opposed? One I was absent, oh, at, one is staying, okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, Ooh, um, adjustments to the agenda, there are no adjustments. Um, items to be signed, I've already signed the town warrants. Order number 17-104 is a 7 o'clock public hearing and action on the request for food handlers and a liquor license from BSN LLC doing business as Portland Pie Company located at 400 Expedition Drive. Is there any public comment? Not seeing any. We'll close the public hearing and the um, motion from council, please. So moved. Second. Second. Any comments or questions to the clerk or anyone? Not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Uh, order number 17-095 is a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 901, the Town of Scarborough Garbage and Recycling Collection and Dispos Disposal Ordinance, Article 1, Sections 1.09 and 1.10 as recommended by the Ordinance Committee. Before I open for public comment, I'd like to have the Chair of the Ordinance give a uh, overview. Thank you. Uh, this is the third time uh, this matters before the Town Council, first reading, public hearing, and now second reading. Uh, 
it involves the prohibition of defacing uh, trash bins on town-owned uh, carts, uh, and that's pretty straightforward. Thank you. Is there any public comment? Not seeing any. We'll close the public comment. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Comments or questions from council? Councillor uh, St. Clair. Um, <clears throat> Well, I understand um, the reasoning behind this, and I do also respect the fact that the um, containers are town property. Um, I still cannot support this because of the one fact of there is no grandfathering in this. And I think it's unfair to um, punish those people that have inherited their garbage cans and recycling containers with stickers on them. Um, and those are the ones that they'll be charged for that. So that's really the reason why I can't, cannot still support this ordinance. Other comments? Council Foley? Um, so I, I stick also with my position of not supporting this. I just really think we're going down a road that is unnecessary. Uh, it's my understanding we received one complaint. And it's also my understanding that Public Works um, has not said this is a, con a big concern or an issue. I understand that it is public property, or you know, property of the town, and I, I can understand it from that respect. But the it's also not specific enough. So, for example, if the uh, offense was indeed uh, a Trump bumper sticker, let's just say, if I take the Trump bumper sticker and I now make the number three on my trash can to denote the number of where I live, am I in in compliance because I'm allowed to put my number on my trash can or not. And I just feel like we're setting citizens up to find silly ways around an ordinance that we just don't need to be wasting time, money, and energy on. I also see it potentially as a, a situation where, um, you know, you're pitting neighbor against neighbor over kind of what I see as good common sense and, uh, you yeah, know, I just, for those reasons, I just think it's unnecessary. It's not really enforceable. We have 14,000 bins, and I don't see it as a big problem. So I uh, don't support it. Councilor Chiazzo? So uh, a couple thoughts. First of all, um, it's public property, period. It's the bottom line. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think the council should be in a position to interpret what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. That's a reason why we don't allow um, bumper stickers on uh, Public, utility, public vehicles, because what might be offensive to me might be perfectly tolerable to somebody else, and we should not be in a position to have to judge that, and that's really the reason why there's a zero tolerance on this. There's, there's no, there is no interpretation, there's no gray area, there's no kind of sort of, uh, you know, way of enforcing this. Um, I don't think it inhibits public speech, because if you want to put a sign or a placard on your house, in your yard, you certainly have that right, and there is nothing preventing you from doing that. Um, but I, I, I keep reverting back to the fact that um, it, it's very difficult for this group to sit down and, and make a distinction between what's okay and what's not okay. And our sign ordinance is a clear example of that. We can't differentiate now between political signs and, and other forms of speech. So rather than make it complicated and decide, you know, what can be and what can't be, I think a complete ban is appropriate. Um, I, I don't think it's going to require a Herculean effort unless uh, somebody's uh, bin is completely covered in stickers, which I personally haven't seen any around town. Um, I don't think it's, it's a lot of work to get a sticker off of a plastic can. I, I really don't, and it may require a little bit of inconvenience. Uh, but at the end of the day, you put in a grace period, and after a while you say if it's a violation, it's a violation, just like every other ordinance we have on the books. So... Um, if they were purchased by individuals and uh, the, the responsibility of the property of the owners, I'd take a completely different tact. But as it is now that uh, I don't think it's fair or appropriate to have uh, somebody who's going to purchase a property have to worry about if there's something offensive to them personally on their trash cans. So I will support this. Um, Councilor Rowan, you had your hand up? Yeah, I, I sure did. Thank you. Um, so I... I have come to a similar conclusion. I'm going to support this. Um, I, I feel like we don't necessarily always get to choose the issues that are in front of us. And while this may seem trivial and trite, um, it, it is in front of us. This is, it seems like an administrative oversight from the get-go that um, didn't prohibit defacing these, the public property um, in the first place, and I think we're correcting that. Um, you know, I, I, 
um, I take the point that there was only one complaint, um, but I, I feel like, again, it was that complaint that brought it to um, the attention of the staff to say that, you know, this really, um, we'd really like to have this on the books so that we can can enforce it. So I'm going to support it. Thanks. Uncle Donna, you're next. Yeah, I, I do support it. Uh, it is public property. Uh, whenever there's public property out there, I mean, there's no defacing uh, utility poles. I mean, this this was really an oversight, I think, in the uh, in the original uh, adoption of the ordinance. It's a widespread uh, provision uh, across the United States, and the research that we've done. Uh, to uh, Councilor St. Clair's point, I I think we will use good judgment. The the people who we have to enforce these provisions are not going to go out and and inappropriately identify uh, people to uh, and selectively choose. I think I have a lot of faith in the enforcement aspects of our town government. So for that reason, I, I'm supportive. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, I mean, I've given this a lot of thought, and I guess from, from several different angles, this I, I won't support this for, for a lot of different reasons. The first is, Absolutely right. There's been one complaint, but let me read that when we asked about what was the complaint, I won't share the name, but this was what was written. I'm writing to ask you about the reference to the ordinance that I highlighted below. There's a residence, a residence on Pine Point Road whose town issued trash cans are covered with Trump GOP political stickers. Not only do those darken each of my Mondays and remind me of the sheer audacity of many Trump supporters, but also it offends me to think the tax dollars are supporting it. So that was the complaint we got. So I think from, we've had a lot of conversations about listening. I have talked to probably 50 people in our community. There is, I am three years on the council. I've never heard anybody complain about the trash bins. I've talked to 50 people since we've done this. Everybody feels that this is just an overreach. Um, a good example of that, even our own, you know, Mike, Mike Shaw, who's the head of you know, Scarborough Public Works was quoted in the Scarborough Leader as saying he has had one or two calls in the whole time we've had the trash bins, which is 15 years or so. Um, recall about stickers on curbside carts. Most of the questions he receives, he said, are about ownership and what happens to the carts when a homeowner moves away. We don't get a lot of calls about that. Shaw said of the decorated carts, it hasn't risen to be on our front burner. So even our own Public Works is saying, so I have an issue about what is the real issue here? Is this the majority voice of our community or are we creating an ordinance for a very small minority? Um, the second question becomes the law of unintended consequences. I have heard several people say, all right, if this is the direction the town's going to take, I will buy my trash cans. And, and just as we've referenced, other communities have done this. It has become in some communities, people are now customizing their trash cans. They're buying them and they're putting stickers and painting them and other stuff. If we have people buy these trash bins, then have we really created a bigger problem than we already have? Because people are going to already, then what are we going to do? The third question I have about this is, the enforcement to me is just unenforceable. I mean, we've got a situation where we're going to rely on is a neighbor calling in another neighbor for an offensive trash bin. We're going to have to put someone on the road in a town vehicle to go out and to inspect that trash bin, decide whether or not it's in violation, bill the party, collect the money, we're talking $45 here, it's going to cost us far more than $45 to try to enforce this. There's 14,000 bins out there. And I think it's really important as we think of ordinances, can we fairly and equitably enforce this across our whole community? What if you have a community where one person objects to what's ever on the trash cans, but a mile down the road, you have another community that nobody cares? We're going to have unequal enforcement. I just think this is an overreach. I think it could be simply be solved by allowing people to do whatever they wanted with the trash cans, but at the point in time the property is sold, they're responsible for providing unmarked bins or whatever to, to whoever it buys the property. So I cannot support I just think it's, it's, it's much too complex. It puts an erroneous sort of administrative complexity on our town. We have resource issues in this town. We've got a tough budget year coming. I, I hate to think we're tracing tra trash bins with political stickers on them as the resources we're going to use for the town to solve some of our town issues. So I won't support this. Thank you. 
Okay. Question to the town manager, if I could. Um, my understanding is is uh, the, it's not possible for a resident to buy their own trash bin. That even this, uh, if there's a replacement or her damage, they have to pay for it. But it's still town property, correct? I, I'm not sure if I've ever been confronted with that question. Um, we would have specifications they would need to comply with the the cans to make sure that the uh, the equipment can properly pick them up and handle them. Um, honestly, I don't think we've ever been asked that question. Um, I, I, I guess more, excuse me, I guess more to my point, um, even if somebody decides they want to pay the fine, that doesn't mean that they accept ownership of the barrel. That's the fine to replace the barrel. It's still town property as far as I understand, right? Um, I suppose so, yes. We okay. would collect that and discard it, I suppose. Right. But, it, but, but my, my point is that there is an option, a buyout option or a purchase option because of the standards required for trash pickup. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, I, I just like, Clary, I, I thought at the last, last, at the first read of this, what we had mm -hmm. talked about is if, the, if it was deemed that the trash can was marked up, the cost would be $45 to replace it. But at that point in time, I thought we talked about and some of the comments from, so I think, Certainly there should be clarity in the ordinance no matter what happens, but I understood from the first read that it was determined that once the person was charged the 45 of the replacement cost, it then became their barrel. So I'm not sure, but I think we should, if we've never had the question, it's certainly something that should be clarified with this process and whatever we decide to do. Um, I, I, I can respect that uh, request. Uh, however, I think it, it is very clear. I think it's stated it's town property. And I don't think uh, just like I can't buy a police car or a, or a, uh, a, uh, a police bike and put whatever things I want on it, um, I think it's very clear in the ordinance that it is town property. So I don't necessarily think clarification is needed, but that's just me. Um, so I, I, I think the amount of time and energy and effort we're putting into debating this is... is um, Certainly interesting, but um, wait till we try to enforce it. Just like every other ordinance that we have, uh, everything is enforceable to a certain level of of ability. Thank so. you. Um, for I am in support of this. However, I would like to ask that there be an amendment, and I would put it in the form that we delay enforcement by six months so that the town manager can administratively administratively manage any um, concerns regarding existing damage. Um, I think that uh, if there is a second to that, I can then I make can. it. The reason I'm suggesting that is that if anything, another item this evening that's coming up regarding the bun bags and the horses is that our enforcement, um, as far as when it is um, enactable, is extremely quick based upon public response and that maybe by giving a delay of six months, uh, the manager and the public works director can deal with any concerns regarding existing um, uh, barrels um, that can be turned in or can be looked at or inspected at the request of a citizen and we can provide public notification of that process. Is there any comments on the amendment? Not on the amendment. Not saying on the amendment. The motion is to um, amend the main motion and delay enforcement by six months so that the town manager can provide administrative procedures to manage any current damage. If there's no other questions, all in favor of the amendment. Well, just a second. So, Katie, do you have something? Well, I have a point of clarification on yeah. the main motion, but not the amendment. Okay. So this is just on the amendment? This is just the amendment. <laughs> okay. Um, all in favor of the amendment? One, two, three, four. That's unanimous. Thank you. Now, the main motion as amended is um, what is before you with the amendment that I read. And did you have a clarification? Yeah. So at the, I think it was the last ordinance committee meeting, um, a question was raised if I had someone, it was a citizen who said I had a um, Animal Refuge League sticker. And the question was if I have that sticker on my bin and I put my address on that, Am I now in compliance and that's okay? I want to clarify because for me, uh, that didn't seem to go along with what the intent was here. Um, but if that's true and that's okay, I want to be able to be clear with those citizens that that still works for them. So say, is that okay if they put their address on the existing sticker? It, it seems to me that uh, good enforcement would make that judgment. Uh, and so you might have a situation where that's quite appropriate. Yeah. She just wanted to know if she was going to be in compliance if exactly. she did that or not. And so I think that in many circumstances that sort of 
uh, response, putting your address on, which is allowed under the um, ordinance amendment. In other circumstances, that wouldn't solve the problem at all. So I think that it's, it falls back to the question of relying upon our uh, enforcement arm within the community. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Um, just to add, I would think that um, one, that would be something that the manager could uh, provide clarity to within his administrative procedures because it would need to be applied equally across the board, including the person who has a Trump sticker, then that puts their address on it. Um, it's not the message um, that's the issue, it's the sticker itself. So you can't be biased towards whichever sticker if you're going to allow it. So it, I, I, I'm very comfortable in the manager. Um, taking care of that in his procedures. I do want to mention, I was actually on the council when we first initiated the recycling program, the roadside, um, and ownership of the carts was a very big issue because it was about whether or not we would then be able to control the trash that's inside because we are owners of the trash and are responsible and how we can then manage that based upon our relationship with EcoMain um, and the ability to control what goes in what bucket uh, based on our recycling system. So um, ownership has been an issue. It was at the very beginning. Um, whether or not that is a um, valid uh, a f a change where maybe the owner of the home becomes that, I think that's a different conversation, but it can be brought up later. Is there any other comments? Not seeing any. All in favor of the main motion as amended. One, two, three, four. All opposed. One, two, three. The motion passes. Moving on to new business, order number 17-106 is a first reading and schedule a public hearing on the Oh, I did it again, didn't I? I crossed it out way too early. Um, this is um, order number 17-105, still under old business, act on the request from Councilor Donovan to reconsider order number 17-087, a second reading on the proposed amendment to the Town of Scarborough's official zoning <laughs> map to rezone the parcel located in the Enterprise Business Park identified as map U39, lot 4701, as shown on the town assessor's map from the general business district B3 to the Higus Parkway District HP. If the motion to reconsider prevails, the information on order number 17-OD7 will be handed out at tonight's meeting. Um, is there any public comment on the item? Not seeing any, um, oh, is there a motion for council? I, I move for reconsideration of order 17-087. Is there a second? Second. Um, comments? Yes, Councillor. Uh, the reason I uh, am uh, asking for reconsideration, one, we had a 3-3, three, three, it was six, six people. We didn't have an odd number to, to get a decision. But really, when I was driving home, I was reflecting on the comments that were made by everyone. And, and the thing that really struck me that I had not emphasized myself, but which impressed me, was the comments of the chair that this matter had been endorsed unanimously by the planning board, had been endorsed unanimously by long range planning, both after extensive reviews, and SEDCO. All the entities that we really look to and rely upon to scrub these kinds of proposals. A lot of work went into it. Uh, and the chair made that comment, and I just didn't want to prolong the discussion by uh, speaking to it then. But going home, I was I was impressed by that, and I uh, I feel very strongly that this would be uh, uh, well considered to re uh, to reconsider it. Um, I do want to give one point of clarification. So while there were six members at the last meeting, the actual vote was four to three not to approve, and since Mr. Donovan was a member. Uh, sorry, four to two. And since Councilor Donovan was in the um, negative and voted against it, um, any person that votes in the negative um, has the authority to bring that back up for reconsideration. The prevailing side. The prevailing side. Whatever that and a three-three vote um, is the negative is considered the prevailing. So, but um, it was four to two. So, Jay's other dying over there. I'm sorry. Jay's dying over there. Yeah. There's something that's got to be shared. So I think. Members of the audience might be as confused as I am. Um, the agenda that was put out tonight is referencing uh, that the act to, excuse me, act on request from Councilor Donovan to reconsider order number 17-086. You've been referencing an order number 087, it is. which it is corrected. Oh. Agenda. So, okay. I just sort of. Thank you. 
want to be sure the room was clear. So sorry. So we'll make that note for our records as well. It does say 87 here. Council St. Clair. Um, I'm glad that Councilor Donovan explained why he was changing his vote because I was really confused when I saw this on the agenda again. Um, I have not changed how I feel about this. I still feel that well, I think that there is a place for this type um, of business. That spot, I do not think is the right place for this. And um, I will still stick with my no. Councilor Chiazzo. So I, I do appreciate uh, Council, Councilor Donovan bringing this up for reconsideration. I was absent at the last meeting, but would have supported it then as well. And I think I stated as much uh, in my comments that I asked to be read into the record. Um, we've been trying to encourage development in Hygis and, and Enterprise Park for a number of years now. Um, and we did um, approve and authorize this use for the Hygis Parkway in 086. So um, I, I guess I do trust the planning board that they've heard the council's concerns regarding this particular project um, and that they will take that into consideration and do their job efficiently and effectively. Uh, as they always do, to make sure the development uh, takes into account the existing comp plan and the, the intent of, of what we have going forward here. So I will support the motion. Any other comments? Councilor Foley? I don't know if anyone here is equipped to answer this, but one thought I had as I drove by that site today was would the existing tree line stay on the lot? Hmm. And I'm sorry, Karen, I'm looking at you guys because I thought <laughs> maybe you would know. <laughs> Um, so let's see what the zoning. It's like the little island, yep. which has some really nice trees, which is fine. That buffers kind of the whole area. So my biggest concern has always been that, you know, so that stretch is the, all the front-facing lots of Route 1, which we are, you know, trying to be very mindful of and thoughtful of with our comprehensive planning and mm -hmm. perhaps facelift of Route 1 in the future. Because um, I'm not opposed to this business or this kind of structure. Just right on Route 1, it was my concern. And if we change the zoning for that one lot, on one business owner and one lot on Route 1, then every other business owner all up and along Route 1 would want the same chance, change perhaps. But if it was behind the tree line and it's not, and it's facing more of the internal, then I, I think I might be able to wrap my head around that, if that makes sense. Absolutely. If it's appropriate. Um, so, um, Let's see, so that, that little island you referenced, that's actually within the right-of-way, um, so nothing would change there, but there is certainly a stretch of this property that does abut directly on Route 1. I'll note that the Hygis Parkway zoning actually has sort of a higher visual impact standard written right into that district than the B3 does. Um, it requires sort of a, a, a um, uh, landscape, it has higher landscaping requirements along its frontage. Um, so actually being in the Hygis Parkway zoning would give it uh, higher design requirements and expectations. So would those exact trees remain? Would they be augmented? Might they be changed depending, you know, I'm, I can't picture exactly what's there. If they were pines, might they be, uh, you know, replaced with some deciduous trees or something to that effect? I can't speak to that exactly, but what I can speak to is that the Hygis Parkway zone does have a higher expectation for its streetscaping uh, requirements than the B3 does. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from staff? Yeah, so my only comment was just to kind of clarify or reiterate my position from uh, a few weeks ago, which was that um, that particular parcel is only really accessible from inside the Enterprise Business Park. I have no problem with it switching um, to be in the same zone as the rest of the as the rest of the park, it really it really feels like you, you're it's separated from Route One by that jug handle. You can't act; it won't have direct access from Route One. It can't have direct access from Route One, so you have to go into the park in order to access it. And it makes a lot of sense to me to be part of the same uh, zone. Thank you. Other, just if I could, if it's at all helpful, there were questions um, posed to the consultant for the owner last week. Uh, and I'm not sure if he was really equipped to answer some of those questions. Mr. Miley is here tonight, the owner of Business uh, Enterprise Business Park. So I just make you aware of that to the extent that there's any information that he may relay that would affect your decision. Not, is there anything from council that to ask of the gentleman? I think we're all set. Is there okay. any other comments or questions from council? Not seeing any, all in favor of the main motion. This is to reconsider. Four. And this is to reconsider, right? 
Or is yes. it, it's reconsidering the whole thing? Mm -hmm. No, it's, I think you, you need, need to, to vote on the motion for reconsideration yeah. first. Yeah, so this is just the action to reconsider. The next action after that is a handout, which will then take up the actual issue, which is what should be 17-087 um, and not 17-086. So the motion 17086 is just the reconsideration. There will be a subsequent one regarding the actual zone. 105 is the reconsideration. 105 yeah. is the reconsideration. Yes, I'm sorry. Too many. <laughs> All in favor of order number 17-105, which is the motion to reconsider. Four, those opposed to reconsideration. Three, so the next item is to take up um, order number 17-087. Oh, go ahead. And the order is, and I'll read it because um, there will be a public comment as well. Order number 17-087 is move approval of the second reading of the proposed amendment to the Town of Scarborough's official zoning map to rezone the parcel located in the Enterprise Business Park identified as map U39, lot 4701, as shown on the tax assessor's map from the General Business District B3 to the highest parkway HP zone as, as submitted by SEDCO. Is there any public comment? Susan Hamill, um, 3 Bay Street. Can you bring that? Thank How you. could there be public comment? Just a question, because there was nothing on the website, nothing on the agenda that provided any material. So. Any other public comment? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. You can wait you to go to the <laughs> podium. Um, I think it's a great idea. Name, name, address. Oh, Linda Voskin, 18 Driftwood. Thank you. And I think it's a great idea, bringing some taxes, good clean business, hiring jobs, you know, maybe behind a few bushes. Haggis Parkway is a great road. Let's bring it in. Thank you. Any other public comment? No, I've seen any. We'll close the public comment. Is there a motion from Council? To move. Second. Comments and questions from Council? Council Rowan. Is this the final action on this? I mean, is this essentially a second read? Okay. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any. All in favor of the motion? Four. All opposed? Three. The motion passes. Thank you. Next item is order number 17-106. It's the first reading and schedule a public hearing on the request to amend the town ordinances as noted below to gender neutral content due to the number of pages in this order and a tested copy of the proposed changes are on file in the town's clerk's office for review. They are recommended by the ordinance committee and before, um, and just so you know, there's, um, I didn't count, going to be more than 20 ordinances that are effective, so I'm not going to list all of those. Um, but I'd like the uh, chair t of the ordinance committee to give a high-level overview <coughs> before comment. Uh, this was some good work by the assistant mm -hmm. town manager, uh, Larissa Crockett, uh, who painfully went through uh, all of the ordinances to uh, make them gender neutral, uh, which was a task, uh, and uh, effectively it uh, it does what uh, uh, what we're suggesting, making. Uh, uh, everything uh, he, she uh, uh, man woman uh, so that uh, uh, it's uh, <coughs> it's current with what it ought to be. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any public comment? Not seeing any. Closing the public comment. Is there a motion from council? So moved. moved. Second. Any comments or questions? Not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Order number 17-107 is a first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments, amendment to Chapter 604A, and this says zero, is that right? Just to make sure, if you can find that. A. The Town of because I know I have the wrong agenda. It's A. 604A, the Town of Scarborough Horse Beach Permit Ordinance, Section 604A, dash regulation on horses on the beach to extend the deadline for the implementation of the containment device four horses on the beast October 1st, 2018. If the chair of the committee and council Dunham could give us a overview, please. Yes, uh, 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 at the last hearing, we had quite a bit of public comment. 
from people uh, in the horse riding community uh, indicating that while they were late to the party, uh, they did want to at least express their point of view. Uh, and I respected that because I've been late to the party sometimes myself. So uh, I did check with the ordinance committee members uh, who all felt comfortable with their vote, uh, but that extending the period of time to make the necessary adjustment, something that was suggested by a number of the speakers at the last meeting uh, for a year until October 1st of 2018 seemed to resonate with people since it was pretty clear that there's some complexities involved in training, purchasing, getting the right kind of equipment, and, and all of those things uh, seem to us to be appropriate. So uh, it was on that basis that I asked that this be placed on the agenda to extend the a start date of the new ordinance to October 1, 2018. Thank you. With that, is there any um, any comments from the public? If you'd like to get up to the podium, and you have three minutes. If you can state your name and address as well for the clerk. I'll try to <laughs> <laughs> I'm Linda Vosky, and I live at 18 Driftwood Lane down in Pine Point. And um, I appreciate the effort and the time that you all have put into this. I don't, we're not here to argue or to challenge. We just want to be able to ride our horses on the beach. I sent out um, an email yesterday, I think to all of you. I'm not a real technical person. I hope you got it, along with my little no. no. And um, what I wanted, I guess, my printer ran out of things too. <laughs> so I'll let's pass start it down. with that. Thank you very much. And it shows um, five or six of us on the beach. Ma'am, I, I, you really need to stand uh -huh. behind because it is being taped and viewed oh, by the public. Okay, thank you. We want them to be here too. Okay. Um, I just wanted to state that those pictures were taken in November uh, 2015, mm -hmm. and there are four or five of us going down the beach, and you're going to look at them and you're going to see no permits on the back of the saddle, and that's because they're pieces of paper, and in the wind of the beach they blow away, then we have to come down to the office and buy duplicates. So we have them in our pockets. Um, the animal control officer is down every low tide. He stops us and he checks each one of our permits, reads it to make sure we are who we are, everything else before we go out on the beach. Um, we go out, this particular day, you can see there are no fishermen. It was November 4th, 2015. It starts, the picture starts just about where Bay Street is. And um, we spent a couple of hours and we went the seven miles. We ran into two dogs that were leashed properly. They just sat down. And horses are not afraid of dogs because almost every barn has a dog. So that's not an issue. Some horses, like dogs, will poop on the beach or in a strange place and some will only do it at home. You know, we really can't control that. So um, we thought, I guess we all misunderstood too. We thought that it was okay for our horses to poop between the watermark and the high tide line. None of us realized that that wasn't the case. So I can understand why I know there's only one resident that complains and or that has complained about this okay. issue. And I know there have been zero complaints to the police department about horses at all for the last year. But I understand that if a horse pooped between those two lines, unbeknown to us, that was not all right. So then we went through the poop bag thing, and I know um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to educate you because I don't think any of you actually own horses have ridden on a beach and know what it's like. And it's like being, you know, if you're sitting in the grandstand at a football stadium, doesn't mean you can go down and be Tom Brady or anybody else. So I think if we take that approach and try to accommodate everybody, um, maybe we can figure this out. And on the poop subject, because I know this person said that they run on the beach and they don't want to have to go 10 or 12 inches to the right or left, poop dissipates in water within 30 minutes. The average poop, if you, in case you don't own a horse, is probably about half the size of your water pitcher. So that's what we're talking about on a seven-mile beach at low tide. And that's where we're at. And uh, as far as Old Orchard, I understand I, I had a condominium, lived in Old Orchard for 15 years. I went down there the other day, and I'm going to tell you a couple things that I think wouldn't allow me to use that parking lot. First of all, you have to walk across the railroad tracks. Then, and horses live in barns and farms out in paddocks. They don't have these things to deal with. 
and they're big scaredy caps. I mean, a balloon is like their worst nightmare, or a plastic bag or something like that blowing around is the ultimate ghost. So uh, what happens is you're asking us to come from the parking lot, which is wonderful, across the railroad tracks, stand at a four-way stop, yes, I will, with all the, cons all the traffic. And if a, a train comes, and if my horse is a thousand pounds and she decides to go six feet over, I'm in a traffic, I'm in an accident. And my shoulder's dislocated. And so what do we all do? And that's what's so wonderful about Herd Park. So in your consideration going forward, maybe on the honor system, you let us use Herd Park. We go down, there's a sign that says horses to the right, and we go down for the maybe two miles or so to Old Orchard. Thank you. It's just uh, something that I'm, Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Susan Hamill, and I live on Bay Street, and I do run and walk on the beach year-round. And horses on the beach is something that we've always had in the off-season. The permit holders have always been required to sign the permit application, which clearly states they must clean up after their animals, just like dog owners. Once they're away from Herd Park, they, they just don't. I know they say they, they, they clean up on the beach, but um, they almost really, they can't get down off their horse, most of them, when you're on the beach away from the Herd Park without assistance. I worked with the Ordinance Committee in 2008 when the ordinance was changed to require riders to wear a visible tag um, with a license number. The idea behind the change was that with the license, with, with a visible license, owners could more easily be identified and reported, and this would change behavior. But sadly, the, this ordinance change had no effect on behavior. At that time in 2009, Old Orchard joined with Scarborough and we, put, we did a joint, um, a combined permit. Before 2009, Old Orchard required its riders to use a bun bag. But when they joined with Scarborough uh, at that point, they dropped that requirement. I encounter many horse riders on the beach, and I often take their photos along with the trail of manure. I have not often sent these to the police department, but I, I have on occasion. Delaying the implementation of the bun bag is really simply saying, we will tolerate another year of allowing horse riders to disrespect Scarborough citizens. These owners simply do not clean up. Most of them cannot actually dismount and remount their horses without help, and they don't carry any bag that could possibly uh, be used to, to take the manure off the beach. What about some other options? If these horse riders truly value being able to ride on the beach, why not let them hire someone who can ride an ATV on the beach with a cart and clean up? What about actually enforcing the current ordinance and, and fining them for not cleaning up? Place an officer on the beach to hand out tickets. It would more than pay for itself. There is not an animal control officer on the beach all the time. I mean, they can ride down there seven days a week at low tide. So to say that there's always an officer that checks them in is just not true. Make no mistake, delaying this ordinance is saying that you can ride on the beach for another year and let your horse do its thing. <coughs> Hello, I'm Jane Grover. I live on 8 Sergeant Road. I've ridden my horse on the beach many times, and I enjoy seeing other people ride their horse on the beach. Every time I run into people, uh, they seem to like seeing the horses. They do take our picture. Um, and I think that it adds to the whole uh, ex Scarborough experience that we still have a place where we can ride our horses. I think this change to the ordinance will um, make it really difficult for a lot of people to be able to ride on the beach. Um, and I hope that all of you can take this year not 
not to delay what's coming, but to think about the impact that it'll make on uh, the riders and the people who enjoy the horses that are on the beach. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, actually you can only speak once. Uh, oh. Not you, I'm sorry. You can actually only speak once, so I'd like to offer an opportunity for somebody else to speak okay, first. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Just push a button at all. Nope. Hi, Donna Chapman. I live in Wyndham. Um, a Cumberland County 4-H leader, horse clubs. And we have 4-H youth that come down and ride on the beach. And I think the cost and the encumbrances of some of these, I'm just going to say it, contraptions that you're asking us to attach to our horses now could prove to be dangerous in the end if you get a, a little bit of a jumpy, spooky horse. Um, I come down to the beach all the time and walk with my sister. We're coming down tomorrow. I've yet to see horse poop on the beach. I think most people have been really diligent, and I'd like to see your numbers as to how many complaints you have had. And the lady who's taken pictures of the poop coming out behind the horse, I hope you had a photo release for that photo. So it just is disconcerting that we're going to this extreme. Um, dogs are still running at large on the beach, even though you have your leash law. You know, I, I just think that there's some things you can do for enforcement. I, most of us keep a muck bucket and a fork in the trailer. You may not get it right then and there, but you're going to go back later to get it, hopefully. You're always going to have one. It's just like that one dog running at large. Um, truthfully, I was hoping you'd come in and, and bring this back up for reconsideration and just throw it. Um, because I don't see a lot of people realize what horses do to the economy. If you look at what's going on in California with the wildfires, 52 horses evacuated in a very little time. Their value was $10 million. So when you start doing this to people and you're not looking at your economic impact, um, people will leave. We'll go up to Popham Beach. We'll go somewhere else where we don't have to have this hassle of attaching things to our horses that could prove dangerous for some of the younger kids. Thank you. Hi, guys. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. You can give your oh, name and sorry. address. Sorry. Uh, Cindy Flaherty and 147 Payne Road here in Scarborough. Um, I just wanted to thank you for bringing this up tonight. Um, it really does mean a lot to a lot of us who are here. Um, I just wanted to show you guys. I have my poop containment device right here. Um, I did purchase one online. There is none available in the state of Maine um, for purchase. This one was $65 plus shipping. Um, and so I figured I do have a couple horses that I could probably train, not all of them, but some of them. So I figured if this is going to be something eventually that I would, I would buy one. Um, upon receiving this, it became apparent that it is not able to be used with um, all except for one of my saddles, and I have 22 saddles. Um, it requires rings on the saddle to work on. I'm also a 4-H leader here in Cumberland County as well. Um, and we do have kids that come to the beach. Um, so anyways, it requires special rings that are right here and right here on the back of the saddle. And like I said, of all of our saddles, one out of 22 has those rings. Um, saddles run anywhere from, this is an expensive one for about $300 up to $5,000, um, the average probably being right around $1,200. So this would be a huge, for my business, it would be nearly impossible. Um, we would no longer be bringing kids to the beach, no longer be bringing 4-H members to the beach. Um, it would really affect us if this does go through in a year or now. Um, so I just hope you can take that into consideration and maybe consider some other alternatives to this issue. Thank you. Any other comments? Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie Keene, and I'm actually not a Scarborough resident. I'm a Buxton resident. Uh, I did start my business in Scarborough in 1993. Uh, I have the Hearts and Horses Therapeutic Riding Center, and um, we do uh, frequent the beach and have for years before permits were even a thing. Uh, the town of Scarborough was fortunate enough to have the racing industry in Scarborough Downs present there. And for years, uh, people took their horses, uh, race horses, down to the beach to um, have them in the cold, salty ocean water as a rehabilitation for people at the track. Uh, I understand that Scarborough Downs is now kind of drying up, per se, a little bit, and there's not that activity. But there are still people from the track that frequent the beach 
and are exercising their horses down there as well. Um, that's a different scenario as far as Old Orchard and having the poop bag ordinance uh, that, that they used to have down there was to cover the idea of having these race horses on the beach and that was something that they were adaptable to as they were driving horses. Um, I would say 99% of the permit holders that are here tonight and probably um, against this ordinance are people that have saddle horses. Saddle horses are not trained to carry that type of device. Um, they're also, you know, not trained to have 15 to 30 pounds of manure flapping at their hawks on the windy day at the beach. We're talking about the off season for the beaches. We're allowed to go down there in October and uh, it ends at, you know, April 1st or March 31st. Um, the majority of the time that I ride down there would be on a weekday. I do not run into people jogging per se. It's in February or March and there's not a lot of people accessing the beach at that point. Uh, on a nice day, you might run into one person, two people jogging and one person walking a dog. Um, I think that, again, you know, there's, you know, one person who might complain in a year uh, or one person in the town who's a complainant. Uh, you have hundreds of people that are buying these permits and accessing the beach. They might come down once a year. They might come down five times a year to be able to ride in the off season. Um, horse manure, again, is biodegradable. People use horse manure to fertilize their vegetables uh, and their gardens. I have people coming to my farm every weekend right now and buying composted horse manure to till into their garden for their vegetable garden for next year or their rose bushes and what have you. Uh, the EPA has no regulation on horse manure as it's biodegradable and fertilizer. Um, horses are herbivores. They have nothing in their feces that is, you know, contagious. There's never been a contagion element between horse and human lines. Um, so I urge you to think of the community and to think of the 4-H kids and other people who are accessing permits to be able to use the beach in the off season. Um, compared to one complained person in our community. Um, we have a lot of Scarborough taxpayers as well that enjoy seeing the horses on the beach and enjoy being able to take a picture with them or pat them when we're down there. Um, so I, I'm glad that you guys brought this to the table again. And like Jane and Cindy had said, I hope that you guys will consider not only just tabling this for a year, but tabling it all together. We want to be responsible. We want to work with the community as far as clean up and do whatever we can do. Hopefully on the side, maybe we can meet with a few counselors and come up with a better plan that will work for everybody. Um, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to get up and speak? Going once. Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Comments and questions from Council. Council Chiazzo. So um, I, I wasn't at the last meeting, but I did watch it. So um, I, I was um, surprised at the, at the responses. It was information that I certainly wasn't aware of, and I definitely appreciated the feedback that we, I know I personally didn't, wasn't aware of those issues and didn't take that into consideration um, making my decision. Um, having said that, um, you know, my concern, my individual concern is the beach and the cleanliness of the beach. I certainly don't want to make a, an, an onerous ordinance or something that inhibits anybody's ability to enjoy the resources that we have. It's one of our major pillars of our community. But I do think that um, allowing the tidal zone to be the cleaning agent, um, regardless of how innocuous uh, the, the, the waste may be, is probably not the best solution. So I'm in favor of extending this for a year um, for implementation of the bun bags for, for a couple purposes many of which were mentioned at the podium tonight. It either A, gives you some time to train the horses and, and, and make those accommodations or come up with some kind of compromise where, uh, you know, again, the goal is to keep the beach clean. It's not to drive horses off the beach. It's not to permit or, or restrict anybody from using the resources that we have, but we do have a responsibility to keep the beach clean for everybody. So um, I certainly will support the one year um, and I, you know, I, I'd be happy to participate in any secondary discussions later on um, if it means we could move something else forward and come up with a good compromise. Other comments? Council Foley? Um, 
So I think one of the things that I want to make sure gets conveyed, well, a, couple, a few things, but um, number one, the, this was not an attempt to uh, limit or restrict access to the beach. Um, if anything, for my, from my perspective anyway, um, it, it, it's definitely not just one person complaining. I've, heard, I've been hearing this complaint for 10 to 15 years, and I walk Pine Point myself um, a lot, and more in the winter than I do in the summer. Um, and so the, the, there is poop there, period. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's real. Um, and so, so that's important to me. This is not, I'm not somebody who's going to react, as you heard earlier this evening, based on uh, the response of just one person. But the current ordinance does read what it, what it reads. Um, and poop was supposed to be being cleaned up all along the way. So I, while I totally respect and understand what you're trying to argue around the compostability of the, the poop, it's still, you know, I had to learn this in the fight around keeping access for dogs. People didn't love my dog the way I love my dog. People don't love your horses the way you love your horses. Um, and the poop is still gross. <laughs> People don't want to step in it. They don't want their dogs to play in it. Um, so I'd be, I'm, I'm very supportive of giving this a year. I'm also um, supportive of some of the creative ideas I heard and innovative things that, you know, were discussed tonight. I'd be open to an ATV uh, hired by uh, the horse community to be down there cleaning up. Um, and if, we, if that year time frame gives us an opportunity to do that, great. The other thing I think uh, that we as a council learned and know that we could have done better, um, although I, I will say this, we also tried. I called four people that I know in town that are horse people. I talked uh, extensively with my niece who's been a rider since she was four years old, owns her own stallion, um, and I said, she said, I said, how are, you know, the horses going to react to that? And she said, well, auntie, have you ever put a uh, sweater on your dog? And uh, I said, well, that's a good question. Yeah, some dogs will wear a sweater and some dogs won't. And she basically said horses are off in the same way. Some horses will have no problem with this and some will. And so her answer, at least so I want you to be rest assured, we did do some diligence. It was not just arbitrary decision making. Um, we were trying to be thoughtful and trying to save the ability for you to, to ride your horses. So I'd be open to the conversations about working together. Um, and I will support the, the year extension. I think that covered it. Um, oh, pretty clear. Um, so I actually yesterday had a conversation with um, a horse rider who she rides extensively at Pine Point. Um, and I talked to her for quite a while. And one point that she brought up that uh, that I hadn't even thought of was um, that there's no access to trash cans once they leave Herd Park area. So as they're riding down, we pull all our trash cans off the beach in the in the winter time, which I really honestly didn't think about. And she was talking about how she actually takes like seven, six or seven Hannaford bags and you know, puts them all together and to clean up after herself. But she's like, I have to carry that all the way back to dispose of that. And she said she thought if there was access to possibly a few more trash cans, and she said not at every single access point, but at the main mm. streets, um, five or six more trash cans down there throughout the season, she thought that that actually could make a difference. Um, whether or not that does. In my opinion, that might be something that we could do this winter I'll, as we push this, I hope this, as this ordinance goes forward, because I am in support of it, um, and we see if this helps, um, and then you all can reevaluate it next year at this time and decide whether or not those trash cans helped and, or whether or not they made no difference and you are going to have to move forward with the bun bags. Um, the one thing that I do feel very strongly about is everybody has a right to those beaches and everybody has a right to a clean beach. Um, and so it has nothing to do with limiting horse riding. It has to do with access. And I, I was, a, I was, you can ask anybody, I was all over the dogs. I mean, just Google my name and dogs and you will see it's not pretty. <laughs> um, but I came around after I educated myself and that's the same same thing that I did before we even implemented this. Um, I knew, we knew as at the ordinance level that there could be potentially problems with some horses and bun bags. We knew that. Um, but the issue was it wasn't just one person that was complaining. We had many complaints about it. 
Uh, I've been down there with my kids. I don't want them to step in horse poop. I don't. If it's biodegradable, great. But I don't. I don't care at that point. I'm cleaning off dirty shoes and I'm mad. So it's it's for me. It's it's about access and cleaning up after yourself. And if we can get to that point throughout this year and see that that happens, then I would see no reason why we would have to push forward with bun bags. But I'm hoping that this is the wake up call that we all need. Um, and you're right, it's not just horse poop that's down there. There's other stuff down there that needs to be cleaned up. Um, and maybe by putting more access to trash cans, it will help people give them a little bit of a kick that they need. Pick up after yourself. It's not that hard. And I do understand it's very different climbing off of a horse than picking up after a dog. So please understand that I'm not trying to make those be equivalent. I know that they're not. Any other comments from Council? Council Hayes? Yeah, just quickly, I think I, I think there's some great comments around the, the table, and I absolutely agree with them. I will support this one-year delay, and then hopefully there's a way the groups can work together to get to a better spot going forward. So thank you for coming and talking and educating us, and, and hopefully the next 12 months we can get to a place that works for everybody. Council Rowan? Yeah, so I, I, I also... Um, support the, the delay of the implementation so we have an opportunity to train the horses as well as perhaps see an improvement in behavior. Um, I think it was really eye-opening to um, uh, to hear all the comments about um, the expectation that it was okay for their um, for the horses to be um, leaving manure uh, in between the low tide and the high tide. Um, it's a 12-hour tide cycle. That, that, that poop is sitting there for a long time. So um, the ordinance is really clear that the expectation is that you're cleaning up after the, after the horses. So. I'll support the, the motion. So um, just a few comments. Um, the last two weeks, I think I've heard every joke about um, beating a horse, uh, horses of a different color in the Wizard of Oz, and uh, a few jokes about poop bags, and maybe some counselors should have one. Um, so I think I've heard it, I have heard it all. I have heard it all. But I will say um, a couple of things. One is, um, well, there may have only been one complaint that precipitated this. I give it the same level as we did with the trash cans and that issue, and that's because if it's logical and it's purposeful um, and there's a reason for what we do, then I think that one person can make a difference. Um, at the same time, I also want to, um, with the comments that I heard from everyone, I've actually heard more complaints, not about the beaches, but Eastern Trail mm. and the fact that they just don't clean it up. So while I never heard, other than one complaint before, I've heard, um, I want to say at least five, ten people that complained about the Eastern Trail and the fact that it's just absolutely obnoxious. So um, I hope that the issue as a whole that over the next year, really this delay um, is kind of a lesson learned in the sense of all of our enactments, but uh, the delay will effectively give a year for us to consider uh, or reconsider other approaches and how, and I hope that through the manager that we reach out to the community, whether it's through um, you know, alternative media such as social media for surveys and input about you know, where do we put you know, uh, dumpsters or, or um, maybe we can recycle a couple of those trash bins that have too many stickers on it and we can put them out there. <laughs> but um, I think that it's doable um, and you know, every problem has a solution and I think this is a good mm -hmm. solution. Any other comments? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Order number 17-108 is an act on the request from the Energy Committee to approve an updated comprehensive energy plan as recommended by our Energy Committee. I'd actually like to invite um, the Chairman of our Energy Committee, Mr. Uh, Rick Meinking, if he could come to the podium. Good evening. I thought I would give you a quick history of what is getting us here today. Back in 2008, an ad hoc energy committee was formed with interested par uh, citizens from the community to try to see if there were ways in which we could help uh, the town of Scarborough recognize the value and engage in energy efficient um, opportunities. Uh, in 2011, the work of that ad hoc committee produced a comprehensive energy plan that was adopted by the council. During the time of 2011 to 2016, I'd like to just tell you what the Energy Committee has done. We've benchmarked all the municipal facilities so we have some idea of 
good places and bad places of energy consumption. Uh, we had the opportunity to apply for some grants through the um, ERA funding, the stimulus funding, if you remember those days, uh, that actually allowed us to install infrared heating in our fire stations, and we did some boiler plant upgrades in some of our fire stations. Um, additionally, the Energy Committee worked on obtaining solar on a beach house, a community service maintenance building, and a North Scarborough fire station. Um, another big aspect of our uh, original comprehensive energy plan was a trigen uh, plant. Uh, you probably heard it humming, silently humming, uh, as you walked into the meeting today. Well, that is producing uh, the electricity that you're uh, uh, able to read your literature tonight. Um, it's also providing the heat for this building. Um, the best thing that it can do is do a little bit more, and hopefully that will happen um, if a public safety building was to uh, become part of Scarborough's plans. Um, one of the big successes of our energy committee was hiring a sustainability coordinator. Um, that's been a notch for uh, the committee members, and, and she's here tonight, and we really do thank you for all the efforts that you have done. Uh, taking the reins of the Energy Committee and funneling all of us. We also broadened our spectrum a little bit and started looking at trash. And we uh, presented to you uh, a year or so ago um, on how to manage uh, the waste stream, uh, recycling and, and the, the solid waste. And I think some of that effort led to a delay in, in what might have happened in a, one of those pay for uh, trash type of scenario. So uh, the committee was able to help uh, delay that, and today we don't have that. Uh, but we do have bumper stickers on trash <laughs> barrels, I guess. Um, so tonight uh, we would like you to take a look at our update to the energy plan, and it's a little bit uh, more encompassing. It's now called a sustainability and energy plan. And it has four major parts. The first part being uh, taking a look at what is sustainability and how can we communicate that to the community as a whole. And it's empowering our sustainability coordinator to build capacity within her office and the resources available to her that could be offset to the uh, other uh, members of the community. Uh, we also have a uh, section in there for sustainable infrastructure, and that's continuing to look at how can we define our uh, footprint, our energy footprint a little bit. Uh, is there more opportunity for energy efficiency? Is there greenhouse gas reductions? Um, and what can we do uh, going forward? Uh, example of that, and you'll see it in the plan, is taking the street lights and moving those into uh, the LED world. And um, that's going to be very exciting. Um, another part of this plan is um, centered around transportation and some of the infrastructures that we can do to uh, offset some of the carbon uh, or the greenhouse gas and whether it's an idling policy or, or purchasing electric vehicles, uh, having capabilities of charging uh, electric vehicles not only for the town uh, fleet but maybe for the, the residential side of the uh, uh, community that owns these vehicles. And then finally, we want to continue to do this assessment called benchmarking and, and hopefully bring a little bit of more of that into the business uh, world where we can get some uh, buy-in from our uh, business community and, and really start looking at Scarborough as being a sustainable and energy efficient uh, community that we uh, feel will pay dividends for whatever reason you may believe in climate change or whatever you want to call it, things are going on and maybe there's ways that we can help. And the Energy Committee has certainly tried to put this plan together. And um, hopefully uh, you'll see one section of it that has a little bit of input from you where we would like to be able to take some of the funding or the savings from some of our projects and roll it into a budget line item where we could then 
tap that line item to continue the efforts of energy efficiency or sustainability. Um, and we didn't set a particular rate of that savings from our projects. We left that up to the council to decide. And um, if I missed anything or you need to get additional information, Carrie's uh, the brains behind all of this, and uh, Councilor uh, Donovan has certainly been uh, a big asset to us. We had uh, Councilor Chiazzo as a liaison for a while, and we started doing this energy planning with him, too. So I'll turn it over to uh, you, Bill, and Chris, and Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, what I would like to do is actually um, open it up to any public comments. Susan Hamill, 3 Bay Street. Um, I think this is great. I think um, uh, I'd love to see synchronized and smart traffic lights along Route 1. Um, driving from Dunstan to, um, to Oak Hills, I think there's 11 traffic lights. So it might take you 30 minutes, but if you, everything's going your way, you can zip through in 10. But I, I, I'm concerned when I look at this document that I don't see very much about doing an economic analysis and making sure that we can afford um, to do all that we want to do. And I think that's something, as a town, we need to be very mindful about um, the fact that sometimes these options, in the short term, might cost a lot more. And um, how long is payoff? So I, I do hope that that will be something that is included in the document. Thanks. I'm just going to wait for the time. Yep. There we go. All right, Benjamin Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. Um, I read through the document. I, I think it's a great idea. Um, I, I like all the suggestions, including, uh, you know, putting tracking devices on the buses in order for families to be able to, you know, look at the smartphone and say, hey, the bus is around the corner. You know, I know I missed my share of buses as a kid uh, by being lazy and uh, not getting out of bed in time. Luckily, I have a car now, and uh, I can drive myself everywhere. But um, one one concern that I, I have is uh, is that um, it's not re not really a concern, but it's a place I think that we continue to grow and maybe start to funnel some more money into, and, and that is the uh, development of these online technologies and SCADA systems. Uh, that bus tracking system would also be good for our fire department and police department. If we have the ability to control every sort of stoplight in town, we can change the direction there. But again, that's going to be asking us to start investing more money into the, the development of online technologies, um, systems that allow us to sort of uh, interact and move into the uh, internet of everything, as they call it, with IP5, where every single light bulb will have its own IP address so you can turn it on and off from a computer. But I think, um, as it's suggesting there with us looking into these things, where we want to be able to present the data of how much this building is saving us in electricity costs versus burning fossil fuels, those are great things. I've been to companies that are proud to show it. I went to a school that was proud to say that they were a Gold Star uh, green facility. It would be awesome for Scarborough to say all our municipalities are this, and it'd be a great place to show it. I just hope that you know we understand that maybe we need to make a new committee that's uh, focused on sort of developing these online tools and connecting and moving uh, Scarborough into a more modern era. We do a pretty good job at putting all our information on the website and stuff. I just think there's a lot uh, more efficient ways to do so. Uh, but I like to say uh, great job on this, and, and I look forward to seeing more about this in the future. Thank you. Any other public comment? <coughs> Not seeing any. Motion from Council? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Comments and questions? Council Chiazzo? So as, as Mr. Meinking mentioned, I did have the privilege of serving as the liaison on energy uh, last year. Um, it's an extremely high-functioning, high-powered group. Um, we, we tasked them as a, as a council to kind of go outside their bailiwick a little bit with the, with the, the trash situation and analyzing that um, and I, I think the, the committee tackled it um, with enthusiasm and, and uh, a, a very professional approach so um, I, I think the group is 
very well positioned to make huge impacts in town, and I certainly would um, be willing to look at that as a, as a reinvestment strategy. And we do, I know in the projects we talked about um, last year and moving forward, the, the ROI is always a key component. Mm -hmm. It may not be on a general basis, but certainly on a project by project basis, it's a, a very key component with the committee deciding what they want to put forward and how they want to focus their energy and effort. And, and certainly I think as a council we can, we can uh, help guide them and, and unleash them, if you will, on uh, opportunities for the town. So, uh, and, and actually, Mr. Meinking was being very, um, uh, very um, uh, mild. We've, we've received a lot of awards statewide and regionally, I believe, as well for our energy efficiency and our tri-gen and, and the different programs we have in town. So definitely a shining spot uh, and something to be proud of in town. And I think we're, we're very much ahead of the curve in other communities and would definitely support moving forward with it. Councilor Donovan? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that I like. I'll just summarize the things that it's, a, it's really a very organized, practical uh, <clears throat> identification of programs and goals for Scarborough to advance. I, I really like that. That's a reflection, really, of our sustainability coordinator. It's a very organized uh, person who really led the charge on this, did a, did a wonderful job of constantly bringing drafts month after month when uh, that we looked at it. Uh, I like the clean energy aspect of this. I particularly like the education uh, uh, for the public to, to understand best practices and have the town lead and demonstrate uh, these in our own operations. Uh, and so I think that's going to, uh, it's going to put the town in a wonderful light. Uh, uh, it requires very close coordination between the planning department uh, and the sustainability coordinator. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's really, it's a very kind of cooperative uh, uh, approach. Uh, it is a high level committee and we're, we're lucky to have them. Uh, mm -hmm. Our chair and our sustainability co coordinator who led this effort should be applauded. Yeah. Other co Council St. Clair. Um, I just want to say I, I talked to what, one, two people that were somewhat involved with this, and both of them raved about both of you. Um, could not say enough things um, about both of you, the chair and Carrie. I know you see, <laughs> we don't see Carrie very much, but she does a ton of work, and I think that the community doesn't realize how much work she really does. And um, uh, once again, Scarborough is incredibly blessed to have people that work with us and who volunteer their time on other projects. Um, and you're a humble man also, um, but I know you're a very busy man, and I know you work on other committees, not just this one. And um, we're really, really lucky to have both of you um, leading the charge on this. And that's really all I wanted to say. I'm very, very pleased with what I see that's coming out of um, this. And I have a feeling that, um, as Councillor Chiazzo mentioned, the awards, I have a feeling that Scarborough will probably be leading the charge on some of those other awards in the future um, if we keep going the way we are with the leadership that we have. So thank you both for your time. Thank you. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, just kind of echo what everybody else said. I mean, it's a great document. The only, only question I had just for clarity or thought is I love the first statement, you know, vision statement about energy management systems that is financially and environmentally sustainable. But I was wondering if, if there's a way to put a focus on in there of both a short term and long term, meaning, and I think it's kind of echoing some comments we heard, we're probably entering a three, two to three year really tough budget cycle. So I know some things have a longer term payback. Is there a way to stage what we're doing so that we get some savings, sort of your concept of the account that you have here, but didn't know if we have any way to kind of change the language a little bit, just, just to kind of keep that focus on it's got to work kind of both short term and long term, and we need to phase in sort of our efforts to get there would be my only, only comment. It's budget neutral if we can. I know, like LED lights, I know it's an upfront investment for a longer term payback. Here's a way we can kind of have an emphasis to stage those things. So it's kind of budget neutral in the short term. Any other comments, Councillor? Um, sorry, Councillor Rowan. Sorry. Um, so I, I'd like to echo the uh, similar comments that, that we've heard, just that I think it's a terrific document. I love how specific um, the actions are and just how dense it is. I, I do appreciate that we did include uh, in the vision statement that it'd be financially sustainable, but I, I take uh, Councillor Hayes' point that, that um, that we need to be thinking both. 
about both, all, the, all the factors and all the, all the time frames. <coughs> but, um, in general, this is, this is wonderful and, and uh, we should pass it. Council Donovan. Yeah, I, and to Council Hayes' comment, I think it is implicit that both long term and short term uh, uh, needs to and will be taken into account since many of those decisions, as the document directs, are made by the town council. Any other comments? Council Foley? You all said it so well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would echo the, the other piece. So, I mean, I, w what I thought about was, you know, even in my own personal circumstance, I'd love to put, you know, solar panels. I'd love to do geothermal. I'd love to do all those things. It's not working in my budget currently. Um, and so as a town, like, we'd love to do all these things. So how do we do that and stage it in such a way that um, we recognize the savings and yet we don't crush ourselves at the onset? So, but great work. Any other comments? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to the next item, order number 17-109. It's an act on the request for the Scarborough Town Council to order the discontinuance of all portions of Avenue 2 located southerly of King Street with no damages awarded to the abundant landowners and to file said order with the town clerk and to send abundant property owners notice of this action and schedule the public hearing for Wednesday, November 1st, 2017 and also a public hearing on Wednesday, November 15th, 2017 as presented by the town manager. Would the manager like to give an overview before public comment? Yes, uh, based on feedback and input provided by the council at the, uh, as part of your, uh, your workshop last, I guess, two weeks ago, uh, these documents reflect essentially four different changes. There are three language changes that various members of council expressed. Uh, I did uh, provide some emphasis by way of highlighting so you could really focus attention on those. Essentially, uh, those pertain to clarifying um, <coughs> items of personal property in terms of what can uh, exist within the easement area. Uh, Councillor Hayes had some questions regarding just making sure that the terminology regarding award of damages doesn't affect uh, future decisions for the town assessor to assess uh, fair market value. And the final matter had to do with clarifications around the, the beach and access to the beach. Um, the attorneys put their heads together and came up with this suggested language. I believe it does, uh, it certainly intends to meet the sort of concerns we heard expressed uh, uh, two weeks ago. The final piece, as Chairman Baybine mentioned, uh, it does incorporate an additional requirement or additional public hearing. So uh, this would contemplate um, starting this evening and the discontinuance process is very clearly delineated in state law. So it must be initiated through this means here tonight. And if you do, we'll actually look for your, all of you to sign this document which causes it then to be filed um, with the town clerk. Uh, but then it would be followed by two different public hearings in uh, your November meetings, if you will. And that was designed, I think, for two reasons. Uh, certainly you could disagree with me. Um, one is to give the public extra time, but perhaps more importantly is to give the Gables uh, time enough to have made decisions as to um, their um, agreement with, with these sets of documents as, as they're currently postured. So with that, uh, we've put this back before you to essentially initiate the process, the final action probably sometime in December at this point, frankly, uh, is the final controlling action. This does nothing other than initiate it at this point. Um, any public comment? Susan Hamill, uh, A Street, hopefully the last time tonight. One more time, this is coming before the council, and I've been involved in this almost since the beginning. <coughs> um, this is certainly something that has received a lot of attention from Pine Point residents and everyone concerned with maintaining public access. We're at this point today because very early in this process, town management and the council made a decision not to defend ownership of Avenue 2 and instead discontinue the street, giving oceanfront property to the abutters in exchange for a public walking path easement. Considering that we are less than a month away from a new council and no documents can be finalized until and unless the Gables condos review and sign off, which won't happen until late November at the earliest and possibly later, 
let's not take action on this now. Let the new council deal with it. And it's aftermath, because whatever you decide um, won't, surely won't be the end of it. We hear a lot about not being able to bind future councils. So this kind of seems like a no-brainer. Stop the process here. Let the future council deal with it. Unless we're really just trying to push this through now, and, um, but this is an issue that the public really cares about and is engaged. So let's do it right. Thanks. Any other comments? Not seeing any. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, comments and questions from council? Council Chiazzo? So I, I could be off, but I think this might be just an, a clerical thing. On the page of the first page of the order, just continues as exhibits A and B, but um, both are labeled exhibit A. I don't know if that's just my misunderstanding or if I'm off on that. No, you'd be correct. It's intended to be uh, each of the two easements will be exhibits and they would be A and B. So okay. Uh, so okay. Characterize that as a scrivener's error at this point. Okay. All right. Questions or comments? Council Rowan. Okay. Uh, question for the manager. Could you just clarify that so there's a final action required in December um, if we were, or at some point, at some were, point. were we to pass it tonight? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And that is the controlling action. What you do tonight does not, does not commit, does not discontinue the street. It initiates the process. Council Sinclair? Um, it's, it's not that I'm, I, I'm against this or, 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 or I'm for it or, or, or I haven't really actually, to be honest with you, completely made up my mind um, yet. Um, but I'm uncomfortable because the Gables hasn't, hasn't, hasn't given us their final weigh-in. And so while I realize that this isn't, um, this isn't binding us to anything, and I, I know that you just clarified that, it is. It makes me feel like it's out of um, process. As it, it's not. We're not doing it the right way. And I just. I don't know why. I'm still. Even from our last meeting, I'm still hung up on the fact that. I don't know. Have we clarified yet about the Gables? Um, did they clarify if. If they get six, versus one, if that still passes for them, or. Has we have not received clarification as to the normal rules of procedure, um, whether. Uh, a simple quorum or a majority of those present at the annual meeting is sufficient to pass an item. Uh, our, our attorneys, as they've expressed uh, to you last week and, and perhaps before, it's really kind of the belt and suspenders approach. Uh, in a perfect world, to avoid any question going forward, they have prepared the documents for all members, all seven members of the Gables, to sign off. Uh, that may be overly um, cautious and not necessarily ultimately required. I will say, however, that this, these documents have not been negotiated in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, the current president of the Gables has been an active participant in these um, proceedings, along with separate counsel they've retained. He happens to be a lawyer, and he said quite directly that he will be recommending approval to mm -hmm. his members. Whether that produces seven people to sign on the line, I cannot say that, but um, well, certainly they've been involved. Uh, and, I under and I completely respect that, and I'm gl really happy to hear that, but when this whole thing started, I also got an email from one of the owners of the Gables, um, and at that point he was questioning some things, and I don't, I have not heard back from anybody if his answers were not. For, I'm not saying staff didn't answer him. He was more concerned about their interpolitics and things like that, and he hasn't gotten back to me whether or not that has been addressed yet. But I, there's just something feels just, I don't, out of out of sync for me. Um, and it makes me uncomfortable voting on something that I don't know if that could change if the Gables all of a sudden decide or they change their mind. I, until I get that approval from the Gables, I have a really hard time pushing this forward. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, I think, I think it kind of feels, to, you know, kind of echoing, kind of putting the cart a little bit before the horse, um, so to speak. I thought we talked about, we didn't get to clear consensus at our workshop, but that very point about without knowing where the gables are, we should table this until we, that meeting takes place and then we're clear about where we are. So I had a little different understanding of, of where it was and why we're sitting here now. Um, 
And I do have a concern by which if we pass the discontinuance tonight, we are signaling to parties that have not signed the agreement. Yes, we have an agreement. Yes, those changes were made. But there's no guarantee either party is going to actually sign that agreement until the Gables meet. So I would like to make a motion because of all that. I think it's the cart before the horse. It is to table this motion until we get clarity from the Gables about whether they're going to move forward. So my motion on the table is to table this until that time. So out of respect to the council, I would ask um, if you might hold on that so other councils could be able to okay. speak on the issue. Sure. And that can be brought up at a, a more okay. appropriate time later after the comments. Date certain. Yep. So. <clears throat> Council Donovan? Yeah, I was reflecting on that question myself, and <clears throat> it seemed to me that <clears throat> since this action merely initiates a lengthy process, and the lengthy process includes two public hearings, we're going to be able to have uh, a, an opportunity for the Gables people to really educate themselves and to express their views. So I thought it wasn't a cart before the horse. The public hearings play an integral part of getting the Gables to understand fully. They're comfortable, the process goes forward, and then late November they make their decision, and then and only then do we need to decide whether the belt and suspenders approach that rightly so, I would have recommended the same if I were in our council's position, but, I'm, but I know enough condominium law to know that it doesn't require a unanimous vote. Uh, so, uh, but I say that vis-a-vis -vis New Hampshire law, not Maine condominium law. So uh, I think there's real value in going forward I don't think we're making a commitment to it at this point. This has been negotiated in good faith and has been a really long process. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think in fairness to everybody, moving it to the public hearing stage would be very valuable. Councilor Chiazza? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with Councilor Donovan as the legal expert in this stuff, being the former lawyer. I think we've, um, you know, we've, we, we have spent a lot of time on this. Um, I, while I didn't participate in the workshop, I did watch it uh, when I got back into town. And, um, you know, I, 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 think it's a, I think it is a long, drawn-out process. Um, I, I think we have negotiated this in good faith by all three parties that were involved. And I don't know if it's a reasonable expectation uh, on our end to expect 100% approval from the Gables. Um, I think they authorized the president to, to negotiate. They had legal counsel. They've been at the table. This isn't a surprise for them. If there are still people that have concerns or questions, I think that's something that that organization has to worry about. Um, and I wouldn't want to hold the process up if, if it was a six to one or five to two or something like that. I think, it's, I think we, 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 we need to get some closure around this. We've been talking about it long enough. I think it's time to move forward. St. Clair? I just wanted to say, just on a follow-up to Councillor Chiazzo, one of my concerns was that um, the Gables were really involved, and then the last three meetings we've had, nobody from the Gables has been here. So I, that made me nervous, that all of a sudden they were involved, and then now they're not mm -hmm. showing up. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's maybe where some of my gut reaction is coming from. Professor Rowan? Yeah, so I, I guess I'm hearing uh, uh, some reluctance from some members of the council and some members of the public about uh, the time frame that we're operating under. And, and I feel like this has been a, a pretty divisive um, issue over a long period of time. Um, and I feel like if waiting six weeks to, to start the process, given that where we are, gets us to a, a place where everyone feels more comfortable, I'm okay with, with tabling and, and waiting even though my personal opinion is that we'd be fine moving ahead since we're not being bound. Council Foley, I think you um, Yeah, I, so I, I think everyone knows where I stand on this issue. I don't want to belabor that because we'll have time in public hearing and other meetings to kind of go into the whys. But when I, but I, will, I do want to make this one point. When I think about, you know, considering disc discontinuance, because this was on our table not too long ago with a different property, um, I think for me it has a lot to do with the circumstances of the situation and it's a property by property kind of decision. Um, that, and I ask myself, why am I doing this? You know, who, what is it bettering? And for me, because this is access to the ocean and, the, and public access to the beach, 
um, it is of the utmost importance for me. And I ask myself, you know, is there a burden or hardship to the landowner if we do not discontinue this road? I don't think there is. Um, and was the landowner properly informed and aware of the circumstances of this public way at the time of purchase? Um, and I think he was. Um, and I only, I totally understand he's got a different position than I do. He's a lovely gentleman. Um, we did meet and appreciated that time. Um, but I, so I'm not, I'm unlikely to change my position on discontinuance. I don't think we should do it. I think we should uh, preserve that for, I, I believe the town owns it. That said, all of that said, um, there are two pieces of information that I think uh, could be the only things that could tip the scales for me. And that might be the, that the agreements were signed by both parties and that we had an actual number for the assessment and that both of those abutters have agreed to that number. So one of my concerns is that I know that the idea of value has been a, a difficult, difficult uh, thing to come to and Tom gave us kind of some range, but I wanna know, I don't think Mr. Gendron is gonna have any problem at all with the number. I'm more concerned is the Gables gonna have a problem with the number. And if we do discontinue this portion, I believe both the butters should be equally assessed for the value of land that's being given to them. So those are the two pieces that could potentially swap me over, but it's unlikely. So I'm just, I will, I would support uh, Peter's motion to delay um, because we don't have that information. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, so I, I, I've heard when this question has been asked in the past that there wouldn't be, I guess I'm responding to Councillor Foley's re most recent comment about equal value assessment. I, I feel like each the assessment is gonna be individually done on each property based on what can be done with the, the extra land. So I, I think it's on a reasonable expectation that there's gonna be an equal assessment on both sides. Councilor Piazza. Yeah, so I thought this was an interesting approach at the workshop discussing valuation. I'm not quite sure what impact that has on this decision, to be honest with you, because uh, that's up to the assessor to do, no matter what, anyway. So um, uh, to, to respond to Councillor Rowan's, you know, thought of, you know, a couple more weeks isn't going to really hurt us, I, I would tend to disagree with that, only because, I mean, we, the process has been going on, and it's a long and lengthy process. We're not making a final determination. We're just keeping the process moving forward, and I think we have an obligation to all parties to do that, and I think the delay, I always ask myself, you know, what, what's the, what's the, the risk-benefit ratio? What do we gain by delaying? Um, six weeks to do what? There's not, there's no new information coming to light. The Gables really kind of are gonna make their decision and whether it's four to three or five to two or six to one, I don't think that's really gonna impact whether this process moves forward or not. Uh, it would be nice to get seven. I don't think it's necessary. So I'm not sure how the delay can really help us in that process. But I do see how moving it forward will keep that process moving forward and, and conclude this finally at some point <laughs> sooner rather than later. I mean, we're spending attorney's fees, we're spending time, energy, staff time, energy, effort, our time, you know, on, on this process. And it's not that it's not worthy of it. It's, I feel like we're just kind of beating a dead horse. We've, we've already kind of talked about this many times in many different ways. So I, I, I really think we should continue this process moving forward. Councilman. Uh, I think the, uh, 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 a motion to table may be in order, but I think it's in order more at the end of the process than now, because there may be more information we need, but now we need to go through this process and find out some things that we will learn in the course of it. Public hearing will be instructive. Uh, the uh, decision uh, the Gables make in late November will be instructive. And we're not gonna act on this to finalize it until all that's known. So I think for the purposes of an orderly pursuit of a matter, having it go forward now makes sense. We'll, we'll all know more at the end of the day, at the end of November and early December when this matter comes up for final action. And that will be the point at which we'll, because it's very possible that if the Gables is not unanimous, that we'll table the thing until we get a comfort level with whatever our council tells us. So I'm, I'd be fine with uh, acting on this tonight. Councilor Rowan. Oh, so I, I was just gonna respond to, to the, uh, the two councilors uh, arguing in favor of moving ahead now. I think that uh, while I personally would agree with that, I think that it's important to bring the, the entire council along and, and having heard significant reluctance from uh, 
other members of the council, um, members of the public around the, the timing of it. I just feel like after 18 months, an extra four or six weeks is not going to um, not going to be such a burden that that it couldn't be overcome. I, I I understand that it's fresh in everyone's mind. We just talked about it, but if we have a date certain of when this comes back before us, we can we can take action and move ahead. So I'm okay with the tabling motion. I'm also okay with uh, with if we a, a tabling motion is not brought forward, moving ahead tonight. Other comments? Is that you're laughing? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'll circle back to just the motion of the table to table it until a date certain in December. If we're done comments, sir. So um, I just wanted to be able to say okay. So I apologize. I usually try to wait for everyone. Um, a couple of things. Um, I actually view this issue from a different perspective. The fact that we are taking an order to discontinue suggests to us that we acknowledge that we are the owner because we're discontinuing something that we own. So I'm not sure where or how or why it's continuously being per um, uh, perceived or uh, received out there that somehow we have given up ownership on this, and I don't believe is accurate. Um, and I think that if anything, even if this action passes and then in the end something reverses, at least we as a council have stated we own it by an action that has actually been taken up. Um, the second is that I've had a chance to talk with a couple of the um, the snowbirds that are down at the gables. And um, to be honest with you, um, their concern isn't about um, the agreement. It's more about the design of the landscaping that they're really interested in, particularly up closer towards the King Street end um, and the units there at the top or at the beginning of the building and that they would like to see at least um, an opportunity. That they have no specifics that there can be um, new um, designs or new kind of um, you know, planting that could go in there. So it was purely about the buffer, or at least about the you know, the landscape, the trees, and the types of plants. So um, they did not share any other concerns regarding the agreement, regarding um, the you know all the other pieces. Um, and I think that there is value in moving this forward um, because I want to have a public hearing on this. I want to hear from uh, more than nothing against the people who come. It's just it's the same people that come. And I'd like to have two other opportunities in which we can do a campaign to have people attend so that we can hear from them. Because if you then move it out beyond the date that we have in this motion, you're then getting into a holiday season in which next is going to be, well, no one's around because it's Thanksgiving and it's Christmas. And now we really now to move it out into January and February. But because half the people aren't down at Pine Point in January and February, well, we really need to move it out to March and April. Um, and there's going to be a consistent attack against the process, even by people who participated in the process. So I am I'm a little bit more definitive, and I think that um, um, while I know that there will be a tabling motion, I do think that this should move forward um, in that process. And the fact is, even if there is a new council, the new council can reverse the decision before the final document is signed. So it's the same effect of either waiting for them to take action or having them take action after we've made a decision. So. Um, with that, if there is a motion <laughs> to table, which is non-debatable, it would need to include a date certain. So, give some suggestions on date certain on the next. It's Look at the Cody. Six. Um, December sixth. December sixth or the twentieth. So in December would be either the sixth or the twentieth of the two meeting dates. I'd say table. It. So my motion would be to table this conversation until the sixth. So the motion is to table um, order number 17-109 to the December 6th meeting. Is there a second? Second. It's not debatable. All those in favor of the tabling motion? One, two, three, four opposed? And it's th three. Thank you. So it is tabled to December 6th. Um, the next item is order number 17-110. Act on the appointment of David G. Sawyer, doing business as Sawyer Valuation Services on an interim basis as the assessor for the town of Scarborough, effective October 19, 2017, and to continue to such time as the council appoints a successor. And is there an overview from the manager? Yes. Uh, Mr. Sawyer uh, and his wife actually um, collectively work under the, the, the name Sawyer Evaluation Services, assisted the town uh, quite well uh, leading up to commitment. Um, I continue my quest to uh, find a permanent full-time uh, assessor had interviews last week and have two active uh, recruitments of individuals that I'm pursuing as we speak. So I'm hopeful that I will have something in place. Unfortunately, in the, in the meantime, it appears as though the assistant assessor is interested in moving on, so I want to make sure that I'm properly covered in the, in the interim. 
Um, we're still having discussions with the assistant assessor, and per perhaps we're able to uh, keep her on as part of the team as well. But I want to make sure that we're able to do the business that needs to be done this time of year that really will be a granting abatements as may be appropriate um, and as they're presented to the assessor. So um, I ask for your support of this to make sure we're in good position to handle the business of the town. Um, with that, is there any public comment? Not seeing any. Closing public comment. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Second. Um, any comments or questions? Council Foley? And, and I, this is going to sound like I'm being facetious, but I'm really not. Could, could a priority be put on this person to, to get us a, a number for Avenue 2 and what that would look like? I'm not sure if that's appropriate. I, I can have that conversation. I'm not going to promise it. I, I'm not, I know some may think I'm being elusive. Your question is an extremely difficult one to answer. Uh, and, I, and, and a value that is proposed at this point will likely, it certainly will change the following year. So I'm not sure what value that will bring. But uh, I do supply you with information from a prior assessor well respected. I suspect when I ask Mr. Sawyer, he may have a different opinion, and it will demonstrate my point that um, it's not a uh, exact science. Gotcha. But I have no problem with yes, this. I want yes. <laughs> any other comments on the motion? Not saying any. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Moving into there are no non-action items. Standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. I'll start with Council Donovan. Uh, committee reports. Uh, uh, Metro Regional Coalition uh, 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 met. Uh, I'll let the town manager speak to uh, uh, several of the items, uh, which include uh, a regional fire facility and uh, benchmarking that they're actively pursuing. Uh, on November 2, GP Cog is going to have a marijuana information session, uh, which I will go to. It will be post October 23, which is the date at which the uh, legislature is uh, going to act uh, to decide what the marijuana statute is going to look like. Uh, I'd certainly uh, invite other ordinance committee members or other town council members to that section. Uh, the election committee met. I'll let the chair report on that. Uh, the energy committee met today. Uh, you got the report on uh, the most important aspect of that, which is a comprehensive plan. There's also a Casco Bay heat pump challenge on October 21st at the library from 10 in the morning to 1 in the afternoon. Uh, and this is a chance to learn uh, how efficiently you can heat and cool your house with uh, heat pumps. Uh, and I would recommend it. I think that's, uh, that's a very advanced uh, technology. We also talked about the LED streetlight conversion program. That's moving ahead very robustly. Uh, they, we are in the uh, 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 process of uh, reviewing the responses from our RFP for somebody to, a company to uh, do the installation. Uh, it was in the CIP budget, so it's uh, uh, expected to uh, be a selection process by uh, uh, early November. Uh, and early to mid-November and a six-month installation, so it'll be done by the spring. Uh, the food waste pilot uh, program is finished. The data is being an analyzed. will be ready by December, as will South Portland's also, um, and uh, the, that committee will report out the results to the town council this winter. So that's it for... Uh, Election energy, and I think that's it. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Thank you. The uh, um, 55 plus uh, program advisory board met uh, yesterday. Um, talked a, a little bit about the membership structure and, and kind of what we need to go moving forward um, to adjust that, as well as um, adding cancellation fees um, to um, people that are signing up to go on trips and then uh, backing out at the last minute, so they're taking up the spot and 
potentially encouraging, incurring expenses that, that the program is then responsible for. Um, but the other thing that we talked about was um, we had um, Andrea Cooper from AARP Maine come in and talk about um, the age-friendly community um, designation that AAP, AARP offers. Um, it was a terrific presentation. I think there's a lot of uh, merit in, in having Scarborough pursue uh, becoming an age-friendly community or, or becoming recognized for being an age-friendly community. Um, that it's a fairly lengthy um, process um, that um, we're hoping to pursue. I, I'm not sure that's the right committee to, um, to house it or if it, there should be a creation of an ad hoc committee uh, exactly, but if anyone is interested in um, talking about it, I, it is something I'm interested in, in pushing forward. So. Council Foley. Uh, communications was the only committee that I'm on that met since our last meeting, and I'm going to let the chair take that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So kind of you. Um, I'm just going to hand out to each one of you um, part of the strategic communication action plan. I think we only need two down there because Sean and Katie already have one. I'm not going to read the entire thing, um, but I do want to uh, read the, the beginning, um, the strategic direction that we have. And that pretty much says, improved communication that encourages increased citizen participation and engagement, which will promote a culture of trust and productive relationships across the council, town staff, and constituents. The members of the communication committee will provide direction, policy oversight, and business decision support for all communication efforts of the town council. The committee will, from time to time, review and offer feedback on the current mechanisms for promoting town council and community engagement. The committee may identify new strategies and resources that will foster and promote a positive and productive dialogue with community members help facilitate improvements to existing and new communication mediums, and they will provide the council with an annual report summarizing the committee's activities from the previous year and recommendations for the year to come. It then goes on to talk about um, some of the things that we're recommending, and I will post this. We'll have this posted for everyone to look at. My plan was going to be, instead of reading this to you all tonight and having a big discussion, was to open it up on, at first I was going to have you just email me your suggestions, but then I thought we could put it on um, Google Docs. And if you are comfortable, if you could add your comments at the bottom of the document, that would be great. And then at the next meeting, I could maybe have that feedback for you all. Um, if you're not comfortable adding it in, in um, Google Docs, you could just email it to me. That's fine, too. And if you're not comfortable doing that, you can do it, give it to me on a hard copy. So <laughs> three options, no way you can get around it. Um, keep in mind that this is really a rough draft. Um, this is, you know, um, three people's ideas and thoughts. Um, and we're completely open to uh, more ideas, more opinions. Um, as you guys all know, I love to talk. <laughs> So I'm, uh, if anybody wants to meet to go over any of this or any ideas that you have, I would love to meet with you and discuss it. Um, I really think that a strategic plan of this magnitude really needs to have the input of everybody that it involves. And that includes town staff and the counselors and the community. So please um, read through it, give me your opinions, um, and um, We'll, we're very open to making changes and um, getting more feedback from all of you. And that's it for me. Thank you, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just a quick, quick kind of a quick update. Um, the, the Shellfish Commission is going through some changes. I'll report back on that. They do need to start work on the, the licenses, which are coming right up. Two, the Coastal Harbor has actually been doing work some, some this summer. It's actually been kind of a joint effort. And I know they've been working with community services. They've come up with some parking recommendations down at the co-op, which really tries to improve access for both recreational users and allowing the commercial fishermen to be able to get their big rigs easily in and out of the parking lots. That will be coming forward. It's still kind of under review with the two committees, but that work is, is they've spent a, the community service has spent a lot of time this summer looking at it and trying to make some plans, so that's coming forward. Um, we just found out, actually, for those that are listening from home, I'm not sure who here might be interested, but at 6 p.m., the um, Department of Marine Resources is going to hold a hearing here. They call it a scoping session, but there's three applications. There's, there's someone who wants to lease three oyster farms um, uh -huh. in the Scarborough area, two in the Nonsuch River. There's two already there. 
and one up the Spurwink River. So they're, they're going to be here to listen to the community about what their concerns might be. So for those especially that are in the fisheries, they may be interested. That will be at um, 6 o'clock here, Monday night. Um, and the next Finance Committee meeting for the Town Council will be the 30th, Monday the 30th at 5.30. Thank you. Thank you. Council Cazzo. Uh No committee reports. Um, transportation and long-range planning have been very focused on uh, Planapalooza and Comprehensive, but we're getting back on our regular schedule again starting next week. Excellent. Uh, from my reports, I got a few actually. Uh, first, library the liaison. There were three pieces that I wanted to share. First is that um, our Scarborough um, Library has received a $2,500 CMP grant for an electric vehicle uh, recharging station. They are looking for additional sponsors. However, they do have one uh, wonderful sponsor with Revision Energy that will be donating the charger as part of the solar panel project that's going to be installed next week. Um, Wonder League Robotics Competition um, that is sponsored by the um, or hosted by the uh, library um, has begun uh, preparing for the 2018 challenge. Uh, for people who don't know what they are, that's a group of uh, young children um, between uh, 6 and 12 years old who uh, program Dot and Dash, which are these two little robots that um, kind of crawl, walk, roll, I don't know. They, thank God the 6 and 12 year olds know more about robotics than I do. Uh, but this, they're going to be receiving missions on how to program from across the nation, so it's a pretty good competition. And then last, um, they wanted me to mention that there are slots open for the, team, uh, the teen lock-in for the middle schoolers. That will be held on Friday evening, October 27th. Activities have been planned by the library's teen advisory board, and pre-registration is required by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, October 25th. Um, with that, um, the next two are a little bit more um, detailed, um, but I have a handout, and I'm going to try to keep this at a more executive level. Um, but um, these documents, I believe, are already available online, mm -hmm. so the uh, citizens can um, have those. And here's one for you. I don't know if there's an um, so the first report is actually from the election, the ad hoc elections um, rules and policy review committee, and I'm just going to cover kind of some of the high level, and then have the manager or the clerk provide any um, supporting detail on that, uh, given the hour. But um, just so that the citizens know, is that um, the council approved an, a special ad hoc committee with this single purpose charge of looking at the rules and policies around our election process in light of um, a couple of. Uh, um, uh, instances in which we had some uh, voter, uh, or some issues with our process as far as uh, vote tabulation and hand counting. So the committee was made up of uh, three citizens who were Kevin Freeman, um, Anthony DeSoto, and uh, Jim Elkin, um, as well as the town manager, the town clerk, Council Donovan as ordinance chair, and myself as chair of the, of the group. We ha did meet twice. Um, in that meeting, we did receive a pretty detailed process timeline of, of uh, activity that the clerk undertakes. Um, it's a very lengthy but very uh, distinct process, um, as well as review the three instances in which we had um, tabulation errors. In addition to the summary overview that I've provided, you also have a copy of, the, um, of a summary document that the manager has prepared with both the observations as well as uh, implementation recommendations for changes to the administrative rules. Um, as well as a letter that we received from the Deputy uh, Secretary of State, uh, Ms. Julie Flynn, who uh, goes into great detail and is um, a wonderful narrative as far as what are the challenges and observations she had given the circumstances, keeping in mind that the Secretary of State's office um, are not in charge of audit auditing elections. Um, we did not sit down and go through um, you know, the hidden chad or the broken chad thing or anything like that. We simply looked at the process and the, and the policies that the clerk undertakes, and then she provided an opinion um, in support of um, some of the changes that the clerk has recommended. Um, for the citizens, what I did want to mention, really the three high-level pieces to understand is that um, based on that information and based on Ms. Flynn's comments, um, the citizens of Scarborough can and should have a high degree of confidence in their local election process. Um, and particularly the complimentary um, um, comments from the Secretary of State regarding our own town clerk and um, the experience that um, her office has um, was really nice to hear from a statewide level. Uh, state law prescribes precisely the timeline and process undertaken by the clerk. So we did not look at any component in which we have absolutely no control of. Um, so that is literally everything regarding when absentee ballots are um, created 
um, up to when the, uh, what they call the voter intake um, uh, documents are received from the state and then uploaded to that. That is prescribed by law. We can't change when we start something. We can't change when it ends um, or submit something. So we looked at what are some of the processes that we undertake that complement those deadlines. And then last is that um, it was a compelling argument um, or an outcome, I should say, an observation that cost-effective measures taken by our town staff can cause strain on resources and process. So as an example, uh, two of the finer details. One is that um, being cost conscious, um, the town clerk uh, for the last several elections has acted as our warden. While we don't pay the warden a lot of money, um, it is a cost saving measure that was undertaken. Um, and so one of the recommendations, and in fact has already been implemented, is that a, t um, a town warden and deputy warden have actually been named um, and will assume that role. That allows her some independence and really to do her job as our town clerk being the supervisor of the election and not necessarily have the hands-on so that we have an additional resource. Um, as well as um, it was noted that having three elections back-to-back, -back, as we did in particular, does have a strain on existing resources. And if you think over time um, how the town clerk's office has run, um, there is fewer staff members than they were years ago, as well as even a couple of years ago. Um, that has an impact because they still have to perform their other daily duties during the regular process. Um, so there's different pieces of details, and so as part of the rec observation document that the manager uh, provided there, our implementation, um, we're recommending as a committee unanimously that they simply be approved administratively since it's um, about the clerk and her staff that have to run this. However, obviously any um, cost implications will have to be understood and undertaken as part of the budget process because one of the more costly items is to move from a hand count process that is taken during the budget um, is to move to um, um, electronic uh, counting and tabulation, um, which costs more money. It's an average of about $3,000 extra uh, per election. Um, so it's going to have a fairly large uh, tag to that. So um, that is our final report. Council Run? Is it possible to ask uh, a question? Um, so Curious, what, what is it about the electronic count that makes it more expensive? Do we, are we renting the machine as a different ballot, or just curious? It's actually programming of the, the machines to recognize the uniqueness of that ballot in that election. Got it. But the cost of the ballot is the, the, So the ballot is different than the cost. And the program. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So just looking at the recommendations with the financial implications, uh, it, the $5,400 says in budget, does that mean that there's no additional costs or that that's already included? So we would add additional staff during elections and it's already included in the budget, that wouldn't be an additional cost? And then if we wanted to go to electronic, it would be 5400 plus another 3000 on top of that, or it would be? It would be the 3000 3000 yeah. 5400 is already there. We, we, okay. Yeah, okay. we have resources to bring on additional staff to assist during elections, particularly during the absentee period. So there wouldn't be like a reduction in the 5,400 if we went right. electron to offset that or anything. It just it would be no. okay. I hear. Is that 3,000 per election? Is that what yeah. I heard? Yeah. 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 Council St. Clair. Um, just two quick things. One, one's an observation. I mean, I think that you know when the third time that we had a problem, you know, there was a there was a, a kind of a public uproar, and I think that one thing that that people need to remember is that the numbers that are given the night before are listed as unofficial results. And there's a reason for that. Um, and what we're asking out of our town clerk and her staff is to do more things with less money faster than we have in the past. And I think people need to just kind of take a step back and realize what we're expecting from these people. And yeah, they do count them by hand, and there is human error. And if anyone's ever actually come and watched an election <coughs> and what these people do and the chaoticness of it, I think they do. And I'm I'm very very proud of our town and our town clerk and what she does and her staff. Um, I think we're incredibly lucky. I mean, yeah, people could look at me and say you're crazy. You've had three you know three election problems. We, we could have 50 if we didn't have the clerk that we had. This is a large town. Um, and to, to put three elections together back to back um, takes a lot of work.
so I just hope that people keep that in mind. Um, and I just want to thank the committee for, for doing this and, um, and for Todi for putting herself, having to put herself out there repeatedly um, and to be grilled and questioned um, when we all know that the job that Todi does. You know, if I can just add, because um, I forgot about the conclusion page that's on here, but uh, Council St. Clair brings it up well, and that is that I really wanted to mention that there was a, there was a conversation around communications, and we did talk about, you know, what if we don't give out, yeah. um, you know, um, un unconfirmed or whatever, whatever the term is, our results. Unofficial. Unofficial, but it's required by law and by the Secretary of State's office. So I didn't know that. it is I not something that. that we have a choice in. But you know, elections are an emotional, um, it's more of an emotional issue for some. Um, and candidates obviously have a direct connection to that um, emotionality as well. It's really about um, the great thing that I heard through this entire process from the state is that the process worked. Yeah. Um, well, one of them, um, it, you know, it, it took a little bit longer to catch it, but it worked. At each one of the steps, it eventually worked. And the outcome, it never affected one of our elections mm -hmm. um, as far as the outcome. And so uh, with that, I just wanted to also mention and say thank you, too, to the committee members because it was a very quick turnaround. Yeah. And I really appreciate their contribution to that. Councilor Hayes. Hey, did, just a quick question. So, so if I understand this right, that you know, one of the contributing factors, it sounds like, is just the number of reballots that we do. And it's kind of perfect timing as tomorrow night, both the Town Council Board of Education is going to get together to talk about, gee, what can we use maybe we don't have? So part of it is the process we put in place, yeah. but the other part of the process, if we can get to yes quicker, um, it takes some of that risk away and certainly some of the burden. So it's just a great, great another reason why that should be a goal we really try to strive for. What, what do we need to do differently to get to a, an outcome? I don't have the answers to that, but it, I think, increases the urgency of, of trying to get there. Thank you. Are there any questions? Just to put a fine point to it, there are nine separate rec recommendations that uh, either we have already implemented or we will have in place uh, for this upcoming general election and expect to continue them thereafter. So um, we have taken this process seriously and, and are implementing every good, sound suggestion that's come our way. Thank you. And thank you to the manager and clerk uh, for working with us. We really do appreciate it. Um, again, those documents are online and available um, for citizens. Um, my la um, the next item, really quick, is that um, we are, or the town is prepared to begin the master plan committee process. Um, to begin that, I would like to announce that I'm going to appoint um, Councilor Chiazzo, who has expressed an interest actually over the past year, to get us started um, once the committee can come back. Um, once it's been formed officially, I would count on Councilor Chiazzo to come back and ask if there's any additional needs from us, including if there's a room for another member, then we can go ahead and appoint that at that time. Um, so, but I would like to at least get that started so we have a resource at the table. Um, understanding that appointments going forward will be undertaken by the next chair as well. Yes. Which one is this? this is the campus master plan? Oh. Yeah. This is the process driven by staff. We're certainly welcome. I'm pleased to advise you, all of you, when those meetings are, and you're certainly welcome to attend if you wish. Uh, we will provide a, an opportunity to perhaps check in with you before finalized, maybe a progress report to the full council if that would be helpful to, as well. Um, the next item is actually, um, and it's um, uh, somewhat convenient because I, I um, finally got to work and uh, looked at our goals and the responses that we received. Um, for Council of Donovan, you're going to have quite a few copies at the end. If you wouldn't mind, maybe uh, I do have copies because this was not made available. I literally just got this done at 4 o'clock, but if anybody would like to see them from the uh, audience, um, we created a goals document um, at the beginning of uh, my tenure and at the beginning of the year um, based on responses that I've received from the councils I've gone through and simply calculated an average um, of what those responses are um, for um, understanding. Um, the scoring uh, mechanism was a scale of one to three. One was considered successful, two was needed requirement, and three was unsuccessful. Therefore, obviously, a lower number is more successful than a higher number. Um, in addition to providing um, a rating for the overall grouping, um, I also asked everyone to uh, comment um, or score. Um, actually, there were no comments, so I didn't get any opinions. I purely got the score. Um, I also then tabulated a score based upon the individual action or measures and metrics to see where we are. And hopefully, have, you should see some consistency with the overall actions 
um, final score with the individual. There's a few that are kind of um, had me scratching my head a little bit because I didn't understand how something could score um, uh, not as well as what I would have expected um, because they're definitive actions. Um, but just um, f overview, um, there were three primary goals. Um, the first was communications and relationships. The overall rating was a 1.2 or 1.17 to be exact. Um, the second goal was around budgeting, finance, and fiscal um, issues. Our rating was a 1.37. And then last was governance, policy, and programs, which is a 1.75. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but I think that, um, and they are, by the way, in no particular order, so they're not assigned, you know, um, like one isn't me. Um, I just put them in there. Um, I'm sorry. Those relate. No, the, I, I'm think, I was thinking of my, the, these, these relate to the subset. So as an example, on the first page under, Communications, the overall was 117 as reported in the summary, but then question number one um, had its response, question two, and you can go through and kind of see where that is. Um, but I hope that provides um, some understanding um, to where we've been. Overall, um, and again, keep in mind that when we decided to take this approach, we did not place any weight on any particular question, so they're all equal in weight. And I guess the only thing that I can suggest is that um, I would hope that as we are winding down our council year that we look at these, I think you all know where you answered, um, and kind of take, a, I always take a self-reflective approach and look at what did I do to contribute to its success or its score um, from a participation perspective um, and kind of just, you know, use that internally. But I thought it was a good exercise. I hope it's useful. Um, and keep in mind that the score could, ch could have changed to some of these. Most of the answers were given to me in August and September. So obviously in three months, things um, can always change, especially opinion. So, uh, Any questions from council regarding this? <coughs> no? Did you get feedback from all of us? <laughs> no, there, I'd actually there was one counselor I did not get feedback from. Um, any, no other questions? I have no other co um, committee um, comments. Um, and on to personal comments, Council Chiazzo. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Tom Manager's report. Yeah. I'll make quick work of it. Um, as Councillor Donovan mentioned, the Metro Coalition, and I, I want to use the opportunity to thank Bill for um, allowing me to strong arm him into the chairmanship this year. Uh, our number was up, Scarborough's number, and Bill was kind enough to step up to that, uh, that challenge. Uh, the two things that we're working on, both actually, um, we've been quite successful in getting Cumberland County to be an active and, and key participant with. Uh, the first is the Regional Fire Training Facility. This is something that, frankly, has been around about 10 years. Scarborough actually approved a CIP back um, before my time, actually, so it's, it's more than 10 years, and that money still is sitting there waiting to be used, uh, if ever. But essentially, this is to locate a new regional training facility that would be accessible to anyone countywide. We've approached the county t on two levels, one to see if they would be willing to kind of forego um, the financing aspects uh, to the extent that it, it uh, provides a benefit and value to all county members. Uh, we think there's some obvious value there. And then also from an administration point of view, they have um, emergency management staff already on staff. Uh, quite likely they're able to uh, manage it as well. So we're pursuing that as we speak. Also, they did complete their financial benchmarking analysis. Uh, the analysis has been taken over uh, full time by the county. The good news for that is actually based on numbers uh, from audited statements. So historically, the challenge has been relying on people to provide updated data. We now, once the audits are issued and they're publicly available, we're able to extract information from those without the involvement of anyone, uh, frankly. So we expect this will be produced year over year. And I'm going to share it with our finance committee and perhaps we'll share that more broadly after that. A couple housekeeping matters. Uh, the town is moving to uh, the Google platform. So actually our web, uh, our email addresses will be changing to um, scarboroughmain.org. Um, so staff is now undergoing uh, kind of that migration training and it's going quite well, I should say. I mention that because uh, you'll be involved in that as well. It does occur to me and I was pleased to hear conversation around Google Docs. That means you're using it. Um, you might need some additional help. So I'd like to do something probably in the month of December to uh, talk to you about that migration and also give you some additional training uh, so you can really maximize um, that platform. 
Reminder, tomorrow night is a uh, workshop at 6 p.m., a joint workshop with the full town council and school board to discuss uh, different approaches to budget and uh, perhaps communication. And lastly, I want to use the opportunity to um, mention, I, I spent most of the late afternoon talking to uh, members of the media. Uh, town staff has been contemplating for four or five weeks ever since uh, Amazon announced uh, kind of a nationwide opportunity uh, to locate uh, a second headquarters. Um, as you're probably aware, um, the Seattle area is where their footprint exists. They're looking at expanding. And uh, refreshingly, they um, have issued, they issued a very flexible, very easy to understand uh, RFP. And for that reason, communities like Scarborough, and I suspect hundreds if not thousands of other communities will uh, perhaps submit a proposal. Um, but we were really presented with a unique opportunity in that um, coincidentally, we were going through Planapalooza and having some larger conversations around visioning. And almost as a validation to what we've been thinking, one of the resonating uh, topics, uh, in fact, I attended one of the sessions and I think all 10 tables had talked about the value uh, and the importance and the interest in the development of Scarborough Downs as kind of a really key ingredient going forward. Um, that was really no surprise, but uh, I guess we've been comforted to have had the opportunity to have a larger conversation in the intervening weeks. Uh, also, we've been able to make contact with the current, um, I'll call them equitable owners. There's a, a party that does have Scarborough Downs under contract. We certainly weren't going to advance a proposal without at least the consent or blessing or knowledge of the current uh, players. Uh, we did receive that finally uh, this week. And lastly, we've been trying to respect our other municipal colleagues. Uh, the, the proposal does allow for multiple sites to be offered. And um, other communities had been considering putting in sites for consideration. In the end, they chose not to. So all of that led up to, in the last two days, really deciding to submit a proposal on behalf of uh, Scarborough and specifically Scarborough Downs property. Um, admittedly, this is probably the longest of long shots. But uh, we see the value of the process um, really forcing staff to um, spend some time to collect the data that this is re requesting, uh, further to pre prepare our thoughts, and to kind of marshal that best argument. And I don't see any downside to that exercise. Uh, if anything, it just prepares us for the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're, we're pleased to do that. The deadline is tomorrow, so mm -hmm. I, I need to give uh, full credit and kudos to Karen Martin. She and Magda are the ones really compiling this. Uh, I had the idea and, and encouraged her to look at it. She's the one doing all the heavy lifting, so I will <laughs> give her all credit. Um, and we'll certainly be sharing that out with members of the council and the public. I know people are interested. Um, so last thing, I just want to, this is a daunting um, possibility. Um, if you look at the full build-out potential of this, it's uh, contemplating as many as 50,000 employees and as much as 8 million square feet of, of, of space. Um, and I can just see all the, everyone's just thinking how could that possibly happen here. Uh, this is, uh, in my mind, very much the front end and if we don't express our interest, we can't even have the next right. level conversation. So I. I hope people will understand it for, um, in the spirit for which uh, we're pursuing this, and we'd like to at least consider the conversation later. Never say never. Excellent. Well, thank you. That's all I have tonight. Councilor Chiazzo. So if we do get Amazon, I think that would be the proverbial chihuahua catching the bus. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, um, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't score if you don't shoot, so I, I commend staff for a, 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 a good, a good uh, approach. Um, so last time we all get to meet together before Election Day, um, it's not always. Uh, uh, there's one more. There's oh, sorry, there's one more. That's right. That's right. Um, Kicking us out early, huh? Can no, no. Uh, well, for all, I'm hoping we're all going to be sitting here, Kate, moving yeah. forward. <laughs> um, I, I did want to kind of comment a little bit today about the discussion. Um, it's been two two cycles now. Um, it's not always budgets and big pictures. Sometimes it's horse poop and yeah. trash perils. So. Um, I, I, as always, commend everybody for their, their passion and their approach. And um, it may seem trivial, but I guess my approach is, if it, even if it doesn't mean anything to me, if it means something to one person in town, I think we have an obligation to at least explore it. So, 
um, I do appreciate the approach and, and the opportunity to debate and discuss it, even something as trivial as what's on my trash can. So that's all. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just quickly, I think, you know, I, I think it was just mentioned, but elections are coming up. There was candidates night. There's some, there's some great video out there. There's lots of candidates out there, lots of choices. So just encourage everybody to come out and vote and spend some time getting to know the candidates that are, that are on the ballot. Thank you. My turn? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Well, usually you say our name. I'm just trying to behave All myself right. tonight. I'm sure the clerk went around right. Fine. Just go. Oh, okay. <laughs> Now I, now I don't know what I want to say. Oh, um, I wanted to just thank the community and the people that showed up to my son's um, 5K, Memorial 5K this weekend. Um, thank you to Councillor Hayes and Councillor Foley um, for coming and um, showing your support. And it was just, um, we had over 300 registered runners. And um, it's just really uh, amazing to, to me to always see the community come together. And it doesn't matter, you know, who you vote for or, or what you support, at the end of the day, um, it's all about celebrating um, a little boy and um, his vision for the future. And um, I just wanted to thank the community that came out and supported us. It really meant um, a lot to me. And, um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Councilor Foley? Um, I have met a lot. Oh, if Amazon does come, I think we should send them a thank you via drone. Like, that would be really kind of a cool way to send in. So anyway, just so you can share that with Karen Martin. Thank you. You want to make a good splash? Mm -hmm. um, ad hoc uh, budget committee discussion. Um, and truly, you know, it's, that was the original proposal, but I'm looking forward to the conversation tomorrow um, with the whole entire school board. And I just, I hope people who have had concerns about it um, do come or do listen in and do share their thoughts. It really, the intent is really about how do we heal our community, how do we get to a better place sooner uh, and work with more diverse people working together uh, towards a goal because that's what I believe is at the heart of our community. And so what structure it takes and what exact format that looks like um, I'm open to a world of possibilities, uh, so I am looking forward to that tomorrow night, and that's it. Council Rowan. Thank you. Um, just one uh, issue tonight. That, so we're three weeks away from uh, election night. Um, we have, for a number of years, really been asking our, our public safety uh, uh, members to uh, work under some pretty deplorable conditions. Um, I would like encourage everyone to um, be educated on the issue, go online. Um, there's a, a Friends of uh, Pub Scarborough Public Safety Building um, initiative out there um, on Facebook, and I think they have a website. I don't know the details. Um, I'm sure Google would have it. Um, um, and and it was a we have really done a very um, thorough job by the building committee to put forward a, a terrific proposal that's going to be on the ballot. Um, this is only going to get more expensive over time. I think really. Um, uh, I'm hoping that people will come out and support the, the um, bond initiative on November 7th. Council Dunham. Yeah, I certainly echo uh, Council Rowan's remarks about the public safety building. This case has been made in spades. Uh, we really need this, and it's only going to cost more uh, uh, as the bond market uh, uh, increases its rates and construction costs go up. Uh, I think it's uh, critical for the uh, benefit of the community that we pass this uh, referendum uh, in November. Uh, I had the pleasure of attending a ribbon cutting, one of those that someone has to go, and I went to Mend Health and Wellness of Maine, uh, a uh, chiropractic and related care facility just opened its office uh, uh, on Route 1 at the corner of Broad Turn Road. Uh, uh, Tracy and Victor St. John are the owners. They're very nice young uh, professionals. Two little boys, uh, uh, two and four, and the Scarborough school system was a big factor, they said, in choosing Scarborough. So I would say in closing, I hope Amazon makes Scarborough Subaru the company car. <laughs> Scarborough Acura. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> accurate. There we go. Uh, just a couple of items. First, um, I really want to commend the Communications Committee, especially Council St. Clair, for 
um, doing a um, dutiful work uh, regarding the committee and presenting their report. Um, this was the very first year in which we created this committee and formalized it. Um, so this really sets in place what I've always considered a baseline for the conversation to begin about the strategic direction. So I really appreciate all of uh, the yeoman's work that went into that. Um, also wanted to mention that absentee voting is uh, available um, during normal business hours uh, here in the town hall. Um, I believe there's about 712 absentee votes already uh, taken. So uh, please come. There's plenty of time. Um, but it goes by fast, so um, it's, this is your opportunity. I think it's exciting about Amazon. The irony was that when I heard about it um, today, um, as well as um, I, I remember having this conversation with somebody and we were talking about it, I'm like, man, that would be really great if we, even if it was just for, you know, to show the interest, I thought it would be great. So I think this is a great job, a great opportunity. Um, you know, whether it's a chihuahua chasing a bus or, you know, whatever it might be, um, I think it's a good academic exercise as well on how we can become more of a marketer of our community um, in the uh, global world um, across, you know, across the board. I think you said chihuahua catching the bus. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, wanted to also mention regarding the public safety, I think the comments were well uh, stated and should be mentioned every time. I do hope the citizens come out and vote. It's a very critical issue for us um, and is needed, so please vote yes. I um, did want to mention last year, uh, Councillor Donovan, as chair, started a uh, tradition of taking a group photo um, in all of our uh, business attire best at the last meeting. I was thinking that maybe we, if we could be prepared at the November 1st meeting, we could take that formal picture that can be used. So if you could come uh, dressed, uh, dressed um, ready for success or whatever you want to call Don't it. Don't we stop only or is it? Um, depends on where you sit. <laughs> I think we were standing. Sure we were standing. Yeah, well, three no, people. The short ones were just sitting. Oh, no, the tall ones were sitting. The short ones were standing. Yeah, three people stand. Yeah, three right. people stand. So, if you could please come uh, wearing uh, whatever you would like, that's uh, totally up to you. <coughs> um, and uh, last uh, but not least, I did want to mention. Um, you know, I I really learned a lot in this elections committee process in a very short period of time. So, uh, thank you very much to uh, uh, Tody um, as well as to Tom. You know, and one of the things that I take out of this also is that, um, and I know there's going to be differences of opinion, but it's very clear based on the research alone around the election process that when the legislature passed a rule regarding um, municipal votes on the budget, the legislative intent wasn't for a standalone community like Scarborough, I don't believe, to have consecutive votes like that. Mm -hmm. It was for the RSUs that had multiple communities that fed into one um, one budget and that they would be given equal weight regardless of their uh, budget size, regardless of the number of kids in their district, um, and regardless of the community as a whole. So, you know, I know that um, um, it might have a um, difference of opinion across the board, but um, to me that is a significant issue that I hope that our uh, new uh, legislative uh, advocate for the MMA Legislative Policy Committee might be able to take up in the new year so that we can get clarification around that. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought that was an interesting aspect of the conversation that we had. Uh, with that, uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Can and I say one quick thing, Sean? Yes. Um, as far as communications, and Sean just brought it up, and I just wanted to just say this really quickly. We've been talking about trying to get this communication committee off the ground for a long time, and I just want to thank Sean for trusting in me when we first met last year. Um, and talked about it and having the faith in us as a committee to really finally put this together. Um, you know, he gave us carte blanche and said, run with it and do what you need, and that really actually meant quite a lot to me. So it's my passion, it's what I love to do, and I thank you for giving me the honor of this, even if it's just for this year. It's been, it's been a really fun experience. I love ending a meeting that would compliments the chairman. So uh, with that, I'll take an adjourn. <laughs> motion to adjourn. So much. Second. All in favor. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.